This meeting for the Committee of the Whole Planning Administration is now called to order. I would ask you to rise as you are able for the reading of the invocation. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our Council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who served our community and who are no longer with us, that we can continue to do the work we must in their memory. Thank you. you may be seated. Uh, <clears throat> Councilor McCurry, I re I, you had something to say? Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Uh, people in the community will probably be interested to learn that uh, Mayor Kevin Davis had his surgery this morning and uh, everything went well. I talked to him this afternoon. He's uh, feeling pretty good. And um, he'll be out of commission for a little while uh, in terms of having to rest up, but uh, hopefully we'll see him online here uh, next Tuesday night in time for council. So um, thanks to everybody that, that passed on good wishes to him. Thank you, Councillor McCrary. Uh, Clerk, can you please take the roll? Councillor Samwell. Here. Councillor Martin. Here. Councillor Caputo. Present. Councillor Carpenter. Here. Councillor McCrary. Here. Councillor Sless. Present. Councillor Van Tilborg. Here. Councillor Hunt. Here. Councillor Sullivan. Present. Through the chair, roll call's been taken. Members of, the, members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest or items appearing on today's agenda? Seeing none. Um, move on to uh, items for uh, consideration. We're going for the separation, right? Yeah, so we're just producing that these are already separate. Yeah. Item 7.1.1, customer experience strategy, and 7.1.2, proposal in Glenhurst Lower Gardens are automatically separated. Uh, members of committee, are there any other items for consideration that uh, consent that you would like to separate for discussion purposes? Councillor Van Tilburg? 7.1.4. Noted. Any others? Seeing none. Uh, Councilor Carpenter, I believe you have a motion. I do, Mr. Acting Mayor, and you are the Acting Mayor as the Mayor is incapacitated, so you are officially the Acting Mayor. Acting Mayor Sullivan has moved by myself and seconded by my ward mate, uh, Councilor Hunt. I believe Councilor Hunt's online, is she? She is. Okay, thank you. That all items considered. All, that all items for consideration 7.1 not separated for discussion be approved. Claire, can you please read the title of the, of the items? Through the chair, the following items are subject to the vote. Item 7.1.3, Corporate Policy Manual, amending the Employee Code of Conduct and Related Policies and Standards. Item 7.1.5, Single Source Procurement of the 2023-2024 Corporate Insurance Policy. Item 7.1.6, Update on Tolling Industry Regulations. 7.1.7 film policy amendment item 7.2.1 2022 year end report on building permit fees item 7.2.2 minutes thank you and call the vote All items not separated for discussion purposes carries on a recorded vote of nine to zero. Members of the committee voting favor are as follows. Councillor Sullivan, Sless, Marn, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Samuel Hunt, McCreary, and Caputo. Thank you. Uh, we do have a recognition of achievement today. I would ask that John B. Lee, Poet Laureate for the City of Brantford, to come forward to read his poem as part of the National Poetry Month. Thank you very much. Uh, councillors, members of the public, uh, it's my privilege to reinvigorate after the last four years of absence, uh, what is called the Mayor's Challenge. April is Poetry Month. Branford has honoured me by naming me Poet Laureate of the City. And uh, I always agonize over uh, what poem to read. And this year I've chosen a poem that relates to the Mohawk Institute. Uh, I'm also the Poet Laureate of the Canada-Cuba Literary Alliance, and I had the privilege of hosting 
uh, a professor from the University of Holguin, Professor uh, Leon, uh, Manuel Leon. And when I brought him to the city, I uh, took him to the Woodland Cultural Center, and I also took him to the Mohawk Institute. Uh, it just so happens, coincidentally, uh, that in 1906, my grandmother was a teacher at the Mohawk Institute uh, for one year. It was her first teaching assignment, and uh, I brought a photograph. I don't know whether that can be seen clearly, but this is a photograph dated April 1907, and it's a photograph that was in the possession of my grandmother, and the names of all of the female students are on the back. As you will know, uh, the history of the Mohawk Institute, it was first established as a boys' school for agricultural students and for the agricultural improvement of the students in, in attendance. But by the time my grandmother was there, there were girls in attendance as well. This poem is inspired by the tour that Manuel and I took uh, of the of the Mohawk Institute had the privilege of uh, a, a lovely young woman uh, taking us through and giving us a tour of what is now sometimes controversially called the mush hole. Manuel in the mush hole. We were given a tour of the now closed Mohawk Institute, my Cuban friend, Manuel and I, following the rote recitation of the train guide as we passed from empty room to empty room, walking the echo-voiced vacancy of the hallway, listening to our own footfalls in the sleepy book drop of her studied incantation, passing from there through the gruel ghost of the kitchen where oat-wormed porridge once boiled in the served cold steel of a blue pot morning, vermin veiled in the bitter breath of her words. And he tried to tell her how it was exactly thus for him, a rural lad in Castro's Cuba, stolen by learning, taken away from his father's rope-ribbed horses, gone to where he lived miles from home. The oatmeal breakfast, the same. The lonesome scholar, the same. The orphan's deprivation, the same, the homesick child, the same, the cruel isolation, the same. However, now Professor Leon cannot gain her attention, wanting to tell her how, like a hothouse orchid, he felt the loss of the forest floor, forced as he was in the pained light, as with each brush stroke of the revolution, his past had faded as a dream will fade in the day. On the back of an old photograph, guilty of having taught there in the mush hole in 1907, my grandmother has recorded the names of every student written in black relief of blunt graphite as though those names were an accusation, too cruel for smiling eyes of the girls grown anonymous in imaginary sunlight where a white dog lay in the foreground on the lawn. Uh, Thank you, councillors, for your kind attention. Thank you to the public. Hopefully my poem has uh, done justice to uh, poetry and to acknowledge poetry during Poetry Month. Thank you, John B. Lee, for attending. Thank you. Move on to delegations. Uh, 6.1, uh, prior to hearing the delegations, I would like to remind those in the meeting today that the following rules of decorum are as set forth in the city's procedural bylaw apply. No person shall display any sign, bannered or placard in the meeting room other than materials that in the opinion of the chair are legitimate audio visual aids necessary in connection with any presentation to be made to council. All persons present shall use polite and respectful language and shall refrain from the use of any language or the making of any gesture that is disrespectful or offensive. All persons addressing council shall speak only on the subject in debate and shall not speak on any other subject. No person shall applaud participants in a debate or engage in conversation or behavior that may disrupt the proceedings of the meeting. Members of the committee, of the committee we have eight registered delegations for tonight's meeting. 
As the city procedural bylaw outlines a maximum of 60 minutes to hear these delegations, the time has now been divided amongst the registrants. Each delegation will have a total of seven and a half minutes, in inclusive of questions from the members of the committee. I would now ask that Cindy Iraqi come up to the mic. Good evening. Please state your name and your address, please. My name is Cindy Orochi. I live at 25 Riverview Drive. Excuse me, um, Mr. Chair, could we get the mic turned on? Oh, is that better? Okay. okay. I would like to explain some of the reasons. I can sit. Okay, yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah, I think the poet just wanted to say. Oh, thank yeah, you. That's you're welcome. Better. Thanks. I would like to explain some of the reasons I am opposed to the establishment of this proposed commercial enterprise in the Lower Gardens. The agreement between the city and the Cockshit family defined the use of the Lower Gardens as the property to consist of gardens and a horticultural center. Covenant 7 of the legal document clearly states, no commercial use shall be made of the property and no commercial building shall be erected. A second quote, that no sale of refreshments, food or drinks shall be permitted except such refreshments as may be sold from a properly operated tea room. In the proposal report, section 9.9, .9, they state that a commercial business, the Golden Teapot, already operates through a sublease agreement with Glenhurst Art Gallery of Brant with revenues retained by the private business in a privately owned commercial business that has access to a new patio for outdoor dining. So as there is already a similar use on the property at 20 Ava Road. This proposal is not a similar use and the tea room was an allowable use according to the cockshit lease. The tea room does not set a convenient precedent. During the ceremony that marked the transfer of ownership of Glenhurst to the city, Ashton Cockshit stated in a speech, in accordance with the wishes of the late Mr. Cockshit, this beautiful property is to be known as Glenhurst Gardens and maintained in perpetuity by the city as a garden, a place of peace, quietness, and beauty for the benefit of the citizens of Brantford. How is a snack bar with live music congruent to the peace and quietness? We do not believe it's the role of city staff in Glenhurst Gallery nonprofit to try to reinterpret these covenants for the sake of convenience. The city made a deal and should abide by the terms of that deal in good faith. Section 9.3 of the, of the staff report states that Glenhurst programs have not returned to pre-pandemic levels. However, based on our daily observations for the past several years, the amount of traffic in the lower gardens has far surpassed pre-pandemic levels. Has a traffic study focused on the driveway of the lower gardens being conducted? This is where the greatest concerns around congestion and safety exist where vehicle traffic, pedestrians, and cyclists all converge. In relationship to development in Brantford, there seems to be an emphasis on community consultation, collaboration, and the concept of being good neighbors. A best practice of community consultation is to identify all stakeholders and bring them into the process early. Based on the information contained in the staff report, this proposal has existed at least since September of 2022, when it was reviewed by the Glenhurst Board of Directors. So it is safe to assume that the planning dates back much farther than that. If the Glenhurst organization is intent on being a good neighbor, why keep all this information private until the flyer went out on March 3rd for a meeting to be held six days later on March 9th? Is this supposed to, be, is this supposed to foster trust? Can this be considered community consultation in good faith? Another concern is a great deal of planning has gone on, even though it appears that based on the existing lease, Glenhurst does not even have the right to sublease the lower gardens because the lease does not cover this land in the first place. Why is this lease being amended now? Shouldn't this process have, process have occurred prior to Glenhurst commencing commercial negotiations? This is currently city property controlled by the city. So why was there not a public request for proposals? Why is only one party being considered to operate a commercial enterprise in a city park? To summarize, I've outlined how the proposal breaches the original deed covenants and the wishes of the Cockshit family. I have described deficiency of trust resulting from poor community consultation and have expressed safety concerns. 
this is an underappreciation of the amount, there is an underappreciation of the amount of auto, bike, and foot traffic on the driveway leading to the lower gardens, as well as pressure on the parking lot itself. Proper studies have not been conducted. Right now, we have the opportunity to choose to preserve an outstanding historical outdoor green space. The alternate is to allow it to be exploited for profit against the wishes of the family that bequeathed the property in the first place. The benefits to the city and the community are vague and at best subjective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Councillor Caputo has a question though. Hi, Ms. Iarichu, pleasure to see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I just had a couple of questions actually. Um, sure. Outside of everything that we're talking about here tonight, do you actually think this, uh, this uh, snack shack is an actual good viable business idea? Um, I would say it could be a viable idea. Okay. Would you visit if it was in a different spot? It depends. It it depends what it would be if it was of interest. Okay. That's all I wanted to. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. I now call up Paul Iarochi. Please state your name and your address. Uh, hi, my name is Paul Yorochi and I also live at 25 Riverview Drive. Uh, I wanted to uh, briefly touch on a few additional points. Uh, some of my observations are based on the fact that my backyard backs onto the lower gardens and I look at this area every day. Uh, the April 18th staff report states that one of the objectives of the lease amendment is to permit the use of the lower gardens for special events. We are concerned about a lack of transparency here. Uh, we don't have any details referencing exactly what this means. What are the parameters of these special events? What are the hours, the frequency, the nature, and the impact of the events? Will the area still be accessible to the public during the events? Also, as of today, we have not seen the proposed lease. As stated, I, I have a direct view of the lower gardens from my residence, and I have a pretty good idea what goes on in that area. I've heard a lot of conjecture about how underutilized the lower gardens are. Uh, to quote the applicant, uh, the, the restaurant applicant, Mr. Schumann, the property is underappreciated empty and void of opportunity. Uh, well, it may currently be void of commercial opportunity for Mr. Schumann, but it certainly is not underappreciated or underutilized. We see people in the lower gardens every day year round. The area is open and available to everyone in the city, and it is full of wildlife, including deer, fox, coyote, and many bird species. On weekends, the parking lot is often full. As claimed in the staff report, Section nine, does a long winding road really dissuade the public from visiting Glenhurst? Who made this determination? Was there some kind of a survey? And if this is true, is the best solution to put a bar at the end of the road? Has anybody studied whether a bar is socially accessible? If the goal or benefit of this proposal is to increase public access to Glenhurst, consider this. In order for the commercial venture to happen, the city is required to rewrite the lease to give Glenhurst Gallery full control of the lower gardens. The way, the way I interpret this is that the city is further relinquishing control over a city park to a nonprofit organization. The nonprofit is in turn providing a sublease to the operator to install a sizable physical structure on the grounds along with additional off deck seating. I estimate the total area to be around 1,000 square feet. A thousand square feet in a previously public space that will now only be accessible and available to paying customers. How does this advance public access to a public space? Glenhurst is zoned OS 1-4. I'm not a zoning expert by any means, but I had a look at the zoning uh, descriptions. I cannot see a bar or restaurant anywhere in the list of permitted uses. There is a further reference to section 6.1. The closest use I can find here is a food service vehicle. The proposed structure doesn't appear to me to be a vehicle. 
I'm curious if Brant Waterways Foundation was consulted. Is this project really stewarding our national, or I'm sorry, our natural resources as is claimed in the staff report? Has anyone studied the potential effects on wildlife of live music or the hum of a generator running 24 seven for six months? Regarding community consultation, I was sad to read on Facebook a couple of weeks ago that Mr. Schumann referred to those who disagreed with the proposal as just some neighbors or that Ms. Olson rallied her supporters to raise an army. Raise an army against who? Does this sound like cooperation or confrontation? Statements like this do not demonstrate community consultation or promote trust. In 2019, Ms. Olson and the Glenhurst Board proposed for the Lower Gardens a 270 person theater, event space, restaurant, parking garage, and a bridge linking the new structure to the existing main building. I've never seen these plans, uh, but I, I don't know how they couldn't have decimated the lower gardens and the adjacent hardwood forest, forever destroying any semblance of what the Cockshut family envisioned for the property. This is the group that is currently influential in making decisions affecting the preservation of Glenhurst as a historic natural public space. And it is another example of planning without engaging all stakeholders in disregard for the intended use of the property. For this proposal, only one operator was considered and only one city park site was considered. Why not develop a commercial riverfront enterprise in an area that is not residential? Waterworks Park comes to mind. Why not redevelop the area behind the casino to make decisions on the best use of any resource, including our river resource? An important principle is choice having comparable options. Why in this case, is there just one choice of location and one choice of operation? Brantford does not need a bar operating in a city park. It is not necessary and it is not necessarily in the public interest. The many constraints that my wife Cindy and I have put forward demonstrate that the site is not a great fit. The use is clearly not in the spirit of the original agreement with the Cockshut family or in line with any other precedent in a city park. Thank you. Does any of the committee have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. I would now like to call up Rick Martin to speak to it. And just a reminder, you have 7.5 or seven and a half minutes uh, inclusive of questions. Please state your name and your address too, please. My name is Rick Martin. I live with my wife, Anne, at uh, 20 Riverview, Riverview Drive in Brantford. Uh, good evening, uh, committee members and members of the public here. Uh, I would like to speak as a resident of Brantford who appreciates and indeed participates significantly, along with my wife and frequent family members, in the enjoyment of the natural river spaces of Brantford. Make note of that term, natural river spaces, please. And make no mistake, Glenhurst Art Gallery and, his prop and its property comprise a very important part of our natural river spaces. With regard to the proposal to locate a food service business at the bottom of the Glenhurst property, I would like to say I do applaud any entrepreneur who comes up with an idea for a new business, a new product, or a new location. However, the location of any endeavor must be evaluated with reference to the impact on the surrounding community, especially if there are alternative locations. Others have spoken or made submissions or will speak about the many other issues and problems created by the location of this food service proposal. I will confine my remarks to the issue of, as I said, natural river spaces as they affect this proposal. Natural river spaces is not just three words strung together to make a point. The term is recognized in the lexicon of environmental issues about river surroundings. Rivers are not confined to their sources or mouths or banks. Just look at any watershed map to see the impact of a river on the land through which it passes. The Glenhurst property, where the food service establishment is proposed to be located, abuts the natural river space Gordon Glaives Trail system 
that runs from Cambridge through Brantford to the South End. An extremely popular part of this trail system is a 17 kilometer circuit that can start and end at Glenhurst. In my opinion, walkers and cyclists do not use these trails for the purpose of finding somewhere to eat and drink. Quite the contrary, they use these trails to get away from any kind of commercial activity. If they want food or beverage on their walk or bike ride that uses the above mentioned trail route, which passes Glenhurst and goes across the footbridge to West Brant, they can always stop at Tim's or McDonald's in West Brant, which are located on Colburn Street West, only a hundred meters, but well beyond the visibility of the trail beside Oak Hill Drive. As a matter of interest, I do that myself quite often. Also, I have friends who come here from Hamilton and Ancaster for the specific purpose of enjoying this biking route without any commercial distractions. I'd now like to draw your attention to some features of the City of Brantford Waterfront Master Plan. The vision, the vision of the Master Plan is to, and I quote, set forth a framework to, to protect the Grand River and its tributaries as a fundamental public resource for the residents of Brantford. This vision includes the following. Natural features will be protected and enhanced and the cultural heritage will be interpreted so that all can understand and appreciate the area's rich history. The trails will be easily identified and accessed and the network will become a widely recognized destination. A diversity of places to access the water will be offered, providing for a variety of educational, recreational and leisurely activities that celebrate the Grand River and that will engage residents and visitors alike. Appropriate development on adjacent lands will recognize the civic significance of these locations. They must be rooted in best practices in city building, strive for design excellence, and contribute positively to the waterfront and Brantford's image. End of quote. <laughs> Nowhere in this division do I see any reference to any commercial endeavor as a contributor to achieving this vision. I particularly note the last part, appropriate development, that refers to lands adjacent to the river being developed. One, using best practices in city building. Two, striving for design excellence. And three, contributing positively to the waterfront and Brantford's image. Does anyone else see a food service business meeting any of these criteria? I certainly do not. Section two of the waterfront components portion of the waterfront master plan is entitled parks. In the parks section is a short description of Glenhurst, its history and its purpose. It talks about the trustees of the estate of Edmund Cockshut bequeathing the property, including the main house, the coach house, the cottage and the grounds to the city to be used for, quote, cultural and artistic purposes to benefit the community. Excuse me. Again, I do not see any cultural or artistic purposes being achieved by a food service. One further idea contained in the waterfront components portion of the waterfront plan is as follows. For years, for many years, the city maintained the lower gardens for annual trial beds used in the parks throughout Brantford. Today, the lower gardens offer access to the trail that runs parallel to the Grand River. Due to the history of landscaping on this site, it would be appropriate to establish a small arboretum. Ravine gardens would provide an opportunity to integrate landscape treatment with the natural features that surround the site. Again, that was a quote. It seems to me that this suggestion for Lower Glenhurst would achieve its cultural and artistic purposes far more than a food, for, food service establishment. 
In closing, I, I know I said at the beginning that I would restrict my remarks to the natural river spaces benefit of Glenhurst. However, I recently received a communication from a friend who uses the trail system probably more than anyone I know. He is very concerned about the alcohol factor in this food service establishment. I think we all know the effects of alcohol on a certain portion of the popular public population these days. It strikes me that the serving of alcohol and its environmental effects in the open area at the bottom of Glenhurst is a recipe for trouble. 30, 30 seconds. Thank you. Not bad timing, eh? I thank, you, I thank you for receiving my comments and observations and ask that you reject this food service proposal in the interest of preserving Glenhurst in its current role in the Brantford community. Thank you. Thank you for coming forward. Uh, we'll be dealing with this issue shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to call Darren Gooder and Grant Schumer to come and speak. You have seven and a half minutes, uh, inclusive of questions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a video to play for everyone. We set up for that. Yeah, there'll be a slight delay. Okay. How is everyone? <clears throat> Darren's not here, by the way. He couldn't make it. Hey guys, Grant here. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate the support. I really do. It means the world to me. Uh, I just wanted to do this video to showcase this can give you a little better idea of what it looks like and what we are doing. So it only sits about 20 feet by 9 feet wide. Uh, it's going to be tucked in the back corner of Glenhurst. It is fully portable. It's done right, professionally classy, and it looks fantastic. Uh, it will fully be run on a generator. It'll have its own water cistern and uh, be completely portable. It will be picked up at the end of the season and moved to wherever location I decide. I'm just trying to do something new, unique, and different in the city. I think it's a fantastic idea. I've been working on this for eight months, and I think it's what the city could use. It'll be great for everyone. Everyone should enjoy that area, not just a select few. Uh, it's beautiful trails and river, and there's not much on it. So go for a bike ride, go for a hike, pop by, have a cocktail or lunch or a snack, and be on your way. It's not going to be crazy and rowdy and loud. Uh, to all those in opposition, I get it. I understand why you wouldn't want this, but this isn't new to me. I know what I'm doing. I've had two successful businesses in town on the lamb and the rope factory, boys, and I know how to not piss off the neighbors and it's in my best interest not to do so. Now let's discuss some of the issues, uh, garbage and smell. Uh, there will be garbage. I'm going to take it every night with me. I'm not gonna have a dumpster down there that will attract uh, animals and it would stink in the hot sun. As far as litter, I'm gonna make sure I'm walking the grounds all the time to clean anything up. Uh, it's just good business. Noise, uh, I'm very respectful about that. I'm not gonna be playing loud music and hooting and hollering and disrupting my neighbors because that's also bad business and it's in my best interest not to do that. Traffic and parking. Uh, I don't see a huge issue here because there already is a parking lot down there. Maybe there'll be a few more cars, but I do expect most of my business to be coming off the trail, walkers and bikers. Porta potties. Yes, there will be some, uh, two or three. They will be locked up every night. They will be cleaned out every week and uh, sanitized daily. They will kind of be tucked behind the sea can and uh, not available just for anyone. Homelessness is another issue. Yes, we have big problems with that in the city. I'm well aware I've dealt with that for a long time. Uh, I don't see that being an issue down here because it's pretty far away from everything. And I will also have cameras and security system and I will be on top of it. I don't want that around my business and I will make sure I do everything I can for that. If anything, I think it helps. Um, okay, alcohol service. Uh, that's necessary for me to survive. Uh, it doesn't mean it's gonna be a party spot, but come and have a drink or two and enjoy the sun and be on your way. It, it doesn't have to be loud and rowdy and it's not going to be. So those are 
the main concerns I've heard. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll be hiding at the back of the room there. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your support. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I hope this can work. I know it can work. There's no reason it can't work. We can work together. And if there's any issues, I will do everything I can to resolve them. So again, thanks for coming. Uh, Drinks on me tonight. Just meet me. At Councilor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you for the presentation. The chair neglected to ask you your address. Could you give us that, please? Uh, 23 Jameson Court. And uh, I have two questions. Um, could you tell us about your water supply? Uh, it's a cistern. What does that mean? Uh, it has potable water and a <clears throat> Sorry, a tank of potable and a tank for dirty water. It'll be hooked up to the back of it. Um, a hot water valve running it up, a hand sink, a three compartment sink inside to meet with the health department regulations. And what sort of traffic prediction do you have in terms of people driving in and people walking or cycling in? Um, I'm hoping most is off the trail, walking, cycling. There will be added traffic. I know that. Hard to say, this is unknown. I haven't done this before, but. What's your break even for a number of customers per day? I don't have that. I have to, uh, I have to see how it goes and uh, tweak accordingly. Thank you. It's easier said than done, right? Councilor Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any kind of lease agreement with Glenhurst now? No. Okay, that's my question. Councilor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome. Uh, your season, what does your season entail? I'd like to be there as soon as I can. As soon as I get permission, the thing is ready to go. I just got to buy the equipment. And then I'd like to roll into November, maybe, depending on the weather. Okay. And your hours of operation? Um, I'm thinking 9 a.m. to before dusk. 9 a.m. to before dusk. So yes. Never during dark hours? No, because I won't be lighting up the parking lot or the trailway. I can't afford to do that. And so that won't happen. Thank you. Yeah. Council Carpenter. Thank you. Just a couple of questions. You said in your presentation, uh, it should be used by everybody, not just a select few. Who do you mean by select few? Not many people use it. Okay. Not many people know it's there. I want to open it up to everyone because it's such an awesome spot. Okay. Uh, and you, uh, generator, you have a generator. Where will the generator be located and how will the noise be mitigated from a generator? It is an inverted generator, top of the line Honda. Um, it's the quietest there is available and we are working on building a little cover for it to even mute it more. So you could put it inside and then vent it out, like inside? Uh, it's going to be outside because I don't think I have space inside to vent it out, but... Uh, but the thing that you cover it with will have a vent for it, so it vents... Yes, it, it will have to. We're still working out the details, but okay. that's happening. Now, You'll be running a business. Would the business be paying any taxes as a business? Uh, of course. Paying taxes. As a business. Yeah, of course. Okay. All right. Thank you. Councilor McCurry, second time. Thank you for the indulgence, Mr. Chair. Uh, the generator will be running 24 hours a day? No, it won't. Do you have refrigeration equipment? Yes. Is it something more sophisticated than ice? <laughs> I'm not going to leave food in the fridge and turn the generator off. Uh, ice can stay in the chest freezer and that so, will stay cold. Okay, so you're not going to run the generator while you're not on premises? No, overnight I'm not going to run it. Thank you. Councillor Sless. Thank you. I'd just like to clarify something. It was stated earlier that you take up about a thousand square feet. Is that a, is that a, a correct number? Um, I haven't done the math on square foot, but it's 20 by nine and the patio is 16 by 20, I believe. I'm not that fast. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's, I'm not either. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, if that's right, that's right. I don't know. Thank you. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank you. We'll be dealing with this shortly. Thank you. I would now like to ask, um, Amy and John Bender to come forward. Uh, just a reminder that you have seven and a half minutes inclusive of questions, and please state your name and your address. Name is Amy Bender, and I live at 27 Riverview Drive. 
John Bender. 27 Riverview Drive. I just want to bring up some uh, concerns I have about the project and a uh, little. I hear you. Use the mic. Oh, okay. Thanks, Rick. I uh, just want to bring up some issues that I have with the project. Um, some um, issues about safety and um, noise and amendments and whatnot. Um, intended, Glenhurst intended to be a peaceful, quiet place. Many parents trust Glenhurst to provide a safe arts and culture experience. The bar project is an inappropriate use of the lower grounds. It seems the resolution has changed the whole purpose of the original intention and deed. The amended lease seems illegal to me. A lease should not be granted and authority not given to Glenhurst. There is a serious issue with people who put greed above safety and change bylaws for their benefit and by allowing alcohol to be served. According to the Canadian Council Substance Abuse, January 23, uh, no amount of alcohol is safe, results in cancer, other health issues, injuries, violence, and death. Government, this is a government endorsed research project. Um, Number one, substance abuse in Canada. Warning sign required will be required on the shack for alcohol dangers. So why would the city of Brantford be promoting alcohol use in family parks? The safety issues of alcohol, impaired driving, no, run, no running water, no hydro, exposure to meningitis, hep C, HIV, viruses, especially if outhouses infiltrated by drug users, no proper hand washing facilities, food viruses from contaminated water. Some of the road issues, to eliminate all the road issues, um, we could close the gate permanently so all walk would walk down to the lower gardens. No maintenance for parking, there would be no signage, no impaired driving risk below to kids, etc. Cost saving, no damage to grass, all problems would be solved. The traffic, the hill, will not sustain without two lanes and a pedestrian lane with guardrails. Too much congestion at bottom of the hill. And also, we could, I would like to say no to the signage for restaurant and parking area. Uh, first come, first serve, that would be discrimination of the general public who come down there. The purpose of a gardens is for all to enjoy. Beware of drunk driver signage added to the grounds. Are you concerned about safety for kids and all who use the gardens? No mention of hill or drunk driving risk in the resolution. The noise. Live entertainment is not a cultural entity of Glenhurst. States a quiet, peaceful place. Perhaps the Brantford Symphony or similar better on Upper Glenhurst, however. Special events need to clarifying and escalating behaviors due to noise may occur. The security, um, you could read the Brantford has um, changed expositor article that was put in by the city of Brantford last week. It notes increased crime, increased surveillance needed this will definitely be a target for the owner personally and vandalism to buildings, patrons, employees, neighbors, and all who use the gardens. Require a full-time officer or bylaw officer. Cameras are an intrusion of public privacy, especially neighboring homes. The financial aspects, no financial is, uh, impact is said in the in the report, but then goes on to say it would cost the city $600 for signs, one extra visit by police and bylaw officers on weekends. That is cost to the city. Let the owner pay for the signs and the extra police protection. He will need it. Renovation of roads on Ava is Mr. Schumann paying for that. Also, will the lawsuit, will the lawsuits, he won't pay damage to grounds, cars, etc will cost the city more than making a donation to Glenhurst's cause each year. The uh, liquor licenses, cities should not be so frivolous about blanket use of liquor permits. The teapot room does not have a license due to one day permits only for events. You're making it up as you go, is what I can understand by the report. This is not an event, alcohol and gaming state. You have an option to dispute it must be posted for public input for a license. 
One reason would be to access uh, um, to good roads, impaired driving safety, as they state in the alcohol and gaming, to apply for a liquor license. If this is not allowed, this is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. Just shut up and obey. This is a private lease and owner, and he should obtain a license for that alcohol. The risk assessments, and there's no um, discussion in the resolution of this being done to come to conclusions. Um, to be done, I believe, should be potential threat of violence, uh, alcohol use in a public family park, assessment of decreasing property values of neighboring properties, public health assessment for proper food handling, hand washing facilities, et cetera, transmission of viruses, health unit state stated when I contacted them, no application or advice was asked of this project. City assessment of roads safety stated they did not have an application or request for advice. Um, and so you could see the previous project assessment that was um, assessed in 2020 for access to roads. And I believe the project was turned down. Uh, no risk assessment, um, pre-approvals. Final minute. Sir? Final minute. Okay. No risk assessment on pre-approvals, just a lot of fluff and proposal on innovation. This is not culture or creative. We do not need more restaurants and bars in Brantford major epidemic with obesity and substance abuse, encourage fitness, relaxation, time with family, et cetera, all the free things. All prices must be affordable to all who use the gardens at this shack. Why not install drinking water fountains, water bottle filling stations along the trail? People listen to their own music. We don't need entertainment. Rezoning, if there is sufficient land elsewhere and no amendments required, water and hydro available, and the project should go there. The Grand Stand by the Casino, right on the river, Waterworks Park, what about Golf and Country Club, Brant Park, all serviceable. The amendments, I would like to request the city to add to the deed of original document of Glenhurst that no further amendments like subleases, buildings that mire the grounds, activities that take away from the peace and tranquility, or that invoke threats to Brantford residents be implemented so this is not allowed to happen again. Nothing about this project makes sense That's and has time. nothing to do with arts and culture. Thank you. We'll be dealing with this shortly. There's, there's no time for questions. I would now ask that Jackie Scatchard and Colin Waring come to the front. Please state name, address, and remember you have seven and a half minutes inclusive of questions. Hello, good evening. My name is Jackie Scatchard and I'm here representing myself and my husband, Colin Waring. Colin and I have lived for eight years on Scarf Gardens. We've attended some different information sessions regarding our community, which we have come to appreciate as both open and transparent. On March the 9th, we attended a community information session regarding the Shack Bar proposal. Present was Grant Schumann, Glenhurst Board Representatives, City Councilors John Sless and Gino Caputo, bylaw officers, and city legal staff. And the purpose of that meeting was to share details about this proposal, to receive feedback, and to respond to questions and concerns from the immediate community. We fully support this initiative. We understand that the menu proposed will be light meals, coffee, tea, as well as a license for beer, alcohol, and beer, wine, and cocktails. We understand it is meant to be a dawn to dusk venture for the summer months. Four months was certainly what was spoken to. We understand that the buildings will not be permanent and that they won't leave any footprints once that summertime is over. We believe that the Shack Bar will offer enjoyment for citizens and visitors to Brantford. In much the same way, the Brantford Lights, the art sales, the summer camps, the art exhibits, the taste of Glenhurst, the golden teapot, the community festivals already do. In the same way that it's a site for wedding pictures, a gathering space before school proms, and even the recently added Potter's Guild um, shop that's in the main building. We watch the traffic at the gardens and onto the trail certainly increased during the pandemic. When outdoor gatherings 
at one time were the only one of the few safe activities for us. And the trails have continued to be used extensively. We continue to see people gathering on the grounds and at spots along the trails as the pandemic has eased to share coffee, a snack, and each other's company. We live at the corner of Ava Avenue and Scarf Gardens. We understand well that there are challenges to living that close to Glenhurst, particularly traffic volume, flow, and speed. That's probably the greatest impact that we experience. And particularly in the month of December, when those beautiful lights are happening, trying to make turns in and out of our street and on and off of Ava can be quite the challenge. Is it inconvenient at times? Yes. But we remind ourselves that we don't own either the roadways or the gardens. Rather, we're privileged to live in such proximity to the parkland and to be able to access it with the ease that we can. We believe that we have no right to expect that Glenhurst or the city will develop activities that meet our needs, simply because Colin and I chose to live where we chose to live. We are grateful when information is shared and solutions are sought, as we believe that this process has, that's what we believe is our right. Those who live in adjacent to the park certainly did express concerns at that meeting, and we witnessed those concerns being heard with respect, Mr. Schumann spoke to the garbage management and the liquor license concerns that were expressed. The bylaw officer that was present addressed the concerns regarding access to the lower gardens after dark, about cars driving in circles on the lower gardens, as well as the concerns with respect to what was deemed undesirable persons in the area. There was some suggestions made from the floor to re perhaps reconfigure the current parking arrangement to um, during the meeting to direct lights away from adjacent yards. And finally, the city's legal team seemed to speak to the issue of a for-profit venture in that space. Glenhurst was bequeathed to the city of Brantford, which is, we believe, the people of Brantford. We view the Shack Bar as a potentially additional opportunity for all citizens of Brantford to partake in this gift that was from the Cockshuck family. We believe that it could potentially raise the profile of both Glenhurst and the programs by sparking interest in customers to attend other events that could be happening in the gardens. It's a unique way to experience for an experience for those using our trail systems, of which we're also proud of here. It could afford the opportunity for creative souls to consider how they could, in some way, use the unique um, add to the fabric of Glenhurst in our city. It's a unique way to use an underutilized section of the park, particularly that grassland that you would have seen in that video. That's the space that's being spoken to, I think, is being somewhat under, underutilized at this time. Currently, right now, it seems to be more of a space of running our dogs, perhaps. It certainly is used for parking, and it's also a place where people generally look to getting energy to walk back up that hill at the back. We welcome the intent that this will leave no footprint in the garden. We welcome the idea that it's a pilot project for four months. While we do believe and hope that it will be successful and a return event in some way for many years, should it prove to be unsuccessful or unsustainable, it doesn't need to be repeated and it simply will become a part of the Glenhurst story. We welcome this initiative. We believe it will be beneficial to all. And we sincerely hope that city council will also recognize the benefits and support this pilot project. Thank you very much for listening. Please refrain from clapping. Um, Thank you. We'll be talking about this shortly. Okay, thank you. I'd now like to call upon David Prang from the Chamber of Commerce. Please state your name, your address, and remember you have seven and a half minutes inclusive of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, David Prang, 19 North Alton uh, Street, and I live there with my two children. Um, I'm a lifelong Glenhurst supporter, first as an arts camper, uh, and now today, uh, through today, as a weekly user of the grounds. And as you noted, I serve on our community through my work with the Chamber of Commerce grant. I'm also smart serve certified uh, recently under the new terms. 
I wish to make three points. First, alignment. Second, responsible business owners. And third, a business-friendly community. Glenhurst would not exist without the entrepreneurial spirit of the Cockshut family. Over six different, well, six, explicitly six different uh, Cockshuts have been uh, chairs or presidents of the Chamber of Commerce, right for grant. Secondly, uh, it's aligned, this proposal is aligned with the Waterfront Master Plan, a, uh, which has been uh, termed a shelf study, but is recently, I, I think, under uh, this council's uh, strategic directions, uh, would like to be activated. And I think this proposal does exactly that. Uh, this also coordinates the work of city departments, which is a, a long-standing uh, advocacy ask of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it also provides an opportunity to uh, begin or to rather further uh, evidence-based decision-making and not a uh, fear-based decision-making. Secondly, you have two responsible business owners in front of you, Mr. Schumann and the Glenhurst Board of Directors. Both parties have a demonstrated record of creative and responsible business ownership. From the Tea Room to Family Day at Glenhurst, Glenhurst Lights, the upcoming Glenhurst, or rather, Grand River Arts Festival, which with, uh, as I understand that there's over 70 different vendors and artists from across Ontario uh, to attend in September. I hope that wasn't a surprise, but it's a good, good surprise anyway. Um, as well as the Taste of Glenhurst, an event that's been happening for a number of years uh, that also involves the, the use and, and service of alcohol that the Glenhurst board has been entrusted to uh, manage responsibly for both the, themselves, the, the artists, rather the, uh, the event, the venue, as well as for the city of Brantford. We also have a dynamic restaurateur taking a chance, taking a risk, uh, who's operated previously in a very tight, highly residential neighborhood spot with his on the lamb restaurant. Parties have demonstrated responsible business ownership and operating for a number of years. Third, the city strives to be a business friendly community. Our leaders strive to support new businesses and entrepreneurial spirit. We strive to make pro-business decisions. We have an opportunity to do economic development that blends arts and culture with commercial enterprise, to improve the quality of life in our community, and the vibrant arts with commercial food service. The final point. This is one minor issue of not in my backyard or nimbyism that you will be challenged with decision making in your time on council, specifically in regards to housing intensification. This one's not pouring any concrete or making any permanent decisions that you will be challenged with shortly. This one's an opportunity to show some confidence in our community, show some confidence in an entrepreneur and in our board of directors of Glenhurst. I ask to you is that you continue to support, continue rather to support the outstanding responsive leadership of the Glenders Board of Directors, our economic development staff, and the creativity, innovation, and confidence in our community of Mr. Schumann. Thank you. Not seeing any questions. Thank you, Mr. Prang. And uh, we'll be dealing with this shortly. Um, I now ask Anna Olson to come forward from Glenhurst. Uh, remember, you have seven and a half minutes inclusive of questions. And please state your name and your address. Thank you. My name is Anna Olson, and I live at 16 Ferrugi Street in Paris, Ontario. Chair Sullivan and members of Council, I am the director at Glenhurst Art Gallery. And I am here representing its board of directors as the applicant for the Lower Gardens pop-up cafe proposal, which requires a sublease to the current Glenhurst agreement. City staff will present many of the reasons why this project is valuable and important for the city of Brantford and for Glenhurst. But let's talk a little more about why we support this. Number one, it attracts a new demographic to our free gallery 
and our surrounding park, which helps us with our COVID recovery. Number two, we stay relevant and sustainable as an organization, creating initiatives that are seen as progressive and innovative. Number three, creating cultural experiences in our community, which is part of Glenhurst's mandate of supporting arts and culture outside of the gallery doors. Number four, there is no place like this in our community or on the Grand River. And number five, mostly because it's cool. But you may ask the question, why does this project have to be at Glenhurst? Glenhurst brings a unique location and demographic to a project like this. And this is a mutually beneficial relationship, which cannot be replicated in another location in this city. But what I'm really here to say is that this project is about much more than Glenhurst. This project is about Brantford. It is about what this city is capable of. We realize that this project has become political, but there is not a single project that is presented to you as councillors that will not have some opposition if the question is asked. For every one person opposed, there are many more voters who want to have a beautiful, accessible place to go for lunch or dinner on the river. Please don't turn your back on those people. Some of them are here. Perhaps some of them would like to stand and show who is in support. Please uh, take your seats. But more are not. Please do not forget them when you make this decision. Change is difficult, and most per people prefer to keep what is comfortable. And quite frankly, I get the not in my backyard concerns of the delegates tonight. But please consider there are just four homes that directly back on to the lower gardens. In the town hall meeting held last month, much was discussed about those concerns and many of the problems presented will in fact be solved with the greater presence in the lower gardens that this pop-up will provide. But nothing great has come from staying the same. Fear of change is not the answer. Taking some risk is the only way to achieve great things. But this project is not a risk. It is very much in line with two of the City of Brantford's major strategic plans, the Municipal Cultural Plan and the Waterfront Master Plan. We have this amazing river that runs through this city and currently there is not a place to buy a coffee, bring a friend for lunch and have a glass of wine or simply go to the bathroom. We are hoping to provide all of these things in a place that does not require a single shovel be dug. Grant Schumann has an amazing track record of running two of the most successful independent restaurant venues in Brantford, and he gets that the stakes are high. He understands the concerns, as do we. We respect the opinions of our neighbours, and we always have. But I ask you this. If we can't do this simple project in Brantford, if we can't place a container the size of two cars by the river, for five months of the year on a one month on a one year lease to give it a try, what can we do? What message does that send to our entrepreneurs and to our citizens? This counselors is about Brantford and the things that we can do here. We have already seen the big important things happening in this city, like bringing the bulldogs to town. We meet people every day at Glenhurst who are new to Brantford, and I can assure you that this lower garden project is exactly the kind of thing that they want. We are capable of great things in this city, so I ask you to vote to help us do those great things, not just for Glenhurst, but for Brantford and the great citizens of our community. Thank you. Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Uh, is, is there financial gain uh, derived from this project for Glenhurst that goes directly to Glenhurst? The negotiated rate for rent is $1,000 a month. So in the grand scheme of a budget, it's, it's a negligible, it's negligible. Okay, but, but it's not detrimental, then it's, it's a positive cash flow from, from this project. Correct. Okay, thank you. It helps, it, it helps in our sustainability for sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just uh, Anna, the the board of directors voted for this back in September, just prior to the last municipal election. 
Uh, this is the first I've been hearing it from it when it got to council. Is there any reason that the community or the rest of us didn't hear about this sooner? Or? Well, as, as you probably all know, um, things with the city take a long time. So we have been trying to um, get a decision on this. And I think this, because this is a new, uh, a new proposal, a new type of proposal that required a lot of different, a lot of hoops, a lot of, and this is unprecedented. I mean, Glenners hasn't done this before. We haven't amended our lease in 50 years. And so there was a lot of moving parts that required us to get to this point. We weren't even aware that we had to get to this point. So that um, that took a long time. So before the board approved it in September, did they meet with any members of council or any city staff to get some feedback before they? We did not. Okay. No. All right, thank you. Councilor McCrary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Um, the most recent lease was signed, I believe in January or February of this year. Correct. Was there any discussion at that time about amendments to the lease? I believe that um, Rick Cox was aware that this was kind of on the table, but we didn't, again, didn't really know how this would work. And so we decided to proceed with the lease as was. Um, so that, and, and I think the thought process was always that this would be a sublease of some kind. I'm very surprised to learn that things at the city of Bradford take time. Shocker, right? <laughs> and as I understand it, you don't have um, a room full of lawyers that look at leases and things, right? Unfortunately not. Great. Okay, thank you, Anna. Thank you for your presentation. Councillor Hunt, 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you. And through the chair, um, Anna, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just had uh, one question, and it's around the Grand River Conservation Authority and whether um, they were consulted or needed to be consulted, uh, given the proximity um, to the river. They were not consulted for this particular project, but they were consulted when we petitioned for the larger building. They were on board with that building. Uh, it's they... Sorry, Sorry, it's time. Okay. Thank okay. you. We'll be dealing Thank with this shortly. <clears throat> I'd now like to call up Maria Sachi, Director of Communications, Community Engagement, Customer Service. If it's friendly with everyone, we're going to move right to this item and go back to the presentation once it's completed. All right. Uh, Councilor Caputo, please read your motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, seconded by my ward mate, John Councilor Sloss, that all items for consideration consent, 7 1 and 7 2, separated for discussion purposes, be approved. Okay. We will start actually with 7 1.2, the Glenhurst Lower Gardens. Any discussion? Councilor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Acting Mayor. You're doing a great job, by the way. Tough circumstances tonight. Um, I want to speak to this project because um, it's really been weighing on my mind for the last week and a half, probably for the last three months. Um, I think this is an absolutely innovative and creative idea. I wish I would have actually thought about it myself. I think from a business perspective, as an operator, Mr. Schumann, I think you've done a fantastic job with both restaurants you had. I certainly had dinner a few times at On the Lamb and certainly enjoyed it. I think the biggest takeaway from those things were it was an experience. And I spent 50 hours a week at work trying to create the same thing, an experience for people when they're there. So from an operational standpoint, I think you could do a, a really good job with this process. And I think that it would actually uh, enhance the gardens. It'll probably be cleaner at times. 
Um, there are a couple stipulations I would like to impose, that being the, the music and the uh, volume of it, and to ensure that that generator doesn't make any noise. But from a business perspective, I think there were a lot of boxes that were unchecked in this. And that's where my business background brings that in. And that was neighbors were not consulted with this. You never approached the individuals in and around that area that could have literally become business partners with you. But with that being said, I think from an innovative standpoint, I think the city of Brantford, and I've lived here for 12 years, innovation is something we lack. And I think it's time for us to stand up and start doing something that shows that we're here, even for something very small such as this, that's going to put us forward. I don't want the county, Paris, Simcoe, Waterford for that matter, taking away opportunities for us to be able to lure people into an area um, because we fail to approve such an initiative such as this. So I just wanted that to be stated. I do have feelings for all the individuals involved. And this is going to be the toughest thing I've had to do for a while, but I just wanted that to be known to everybody here. Thank you. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's a few things that, that weren't touched on. Um, one of the concerns I have is, is the portal that's or, uh, an area for uh, vandalism. And I see that being a major problem at this location. And we've been told that the generator is quiet, but we're also told that measures will be taken to mitigate the noise. Well, which is it? Is it quiet or does it need to be mitigated? So I, uh, I think that it's been said the generator won't be running at night, but uh, I don't know how you keep your fridge running at night without a generator when you have no power. And one thing that hasn't been brought up is with the construction of the Averroad to Paris, or the Brand Ave to Paris Road Bridge uh, this summer, Averroad's going to be a disaster for traffic as it is. You add in this venture and it's going to compound that. Um, so for those reasons, I'll, I'll be voting against this proposal tonight. Uh, it sounds like a good idea, but I don't think this is the right location. A location that is, has water services and hydro would be a far better location for this. And off the top of my head, I can think of Branch Crossing as a possible location for this kind of operation. It's not near any residences and would be a good, good place for this kind of thing. It's right on the trails, services the trail area, and has ample parking as well. So. I think we need to consider other locations before we, we approve this at Glenhurst. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you and through you to staff. Um, there were a number of concerns raised by delegates in the immediate neighborhood, and though they may only be four, they are an important four. Um, I wonder if, if uh, staff could speak to whether this is um, uh, appropriate for the OS zoning as was uh, questioned. Andy McMahon, Director of Building Services and Chief Building Official. Through the chair to you, Councillor, uh, for the OS 1-4 zoning for this property, this would be considered an extension of the use of the art gallery, which is a permitted use. Thank you, Andy. Um, secondly, um, there was mention of water service being provided by a cistern. That would be an above ground tank. Does the staff have an understanding of that? Through the chair, I have not seen the plans for it, so okay. I don't have an exact um, vision of what that is. Your folks would be looking at a site plan for site plan approval? Through the chair, that uh, my understanding is that is submitted to the planning department. Already. Maybe you folks should all come up to the microphones.
Good evening uh, through the chair to the councillor, Nicole Wilmot, uh, Chief Planner, Director of Planning and Development Services. Um, just with relation to your question on site plans, so we have received a letter detailing their proposal um, and uh, site plan approval will be required for this development. We have yet to receive a site plan application, but we intend to, depending on the decision tonight, we depend to work with the applicants through that site planning process. And many of those technical questions around things like a cistern and how they'll be mitigated and, and located on site would be addressed through that site planning process. Thanks, Nicole. And this is neither endorsed nor prohibited by the Waterfront Master Plan? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, the Waterfront Master Plan is, is a document that is built upon several pillars. There's not one pillar that uh, speaks to the prohibition of, of commercial development and along our waterfront. It is a collection of several pillars that look to um, the city to promote the use of our waterfront, promote authentic tourism, uh, promote our natural resources, all under, under the umbrella of environmental sustainability. So I wouldn't say that the uh, Waterfront Master Plan is a document here that would prohibit this type of use along the waterfront. So neither endorsed nor prohibited. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we learned this afternoon uh, that there's a heritage designation um, affixed to the Glenhurst grounds and buildings, is that correct? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, yes, that is correct. Uh, the property at A20 Ava Road is a heritage designated property. Uh, so a heritage permit would be required for uh, the, the construction of this or, or the placement of, of this unit. Um, and that would be, a, again, addressed through the site plan process. We would coordinate that through the site planning process. Heritage committee uh, endorsement required? Heritage committee will uh, provide comment on, uh, on the permit and they will be required to give a recommendation. Okay. Um, any uh, any any inquiries made of trail users with respect to uh, their desire or lack thereof for such a thing at this location? I'll take that as a no. Uh, not through the planning department. No. No. Okay. Through Sarah. No. No. Uh, no survey of trail users. Uh, Sarah Monroe, Director of Economic Development, Tourism and Cultural Initiatives, through the Chair of Councillor McCreary, no such survey has been done. I know Councillor McCreary, would you like to go back in queue? Oh, I'll, I'll decide a bit later, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thank you. <clears throat> and through you to staff. Um, so thank you, Nicole, for the, um, you answered quite a few questions around the uh, site plan application process. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, I'm supportive of this from the standpoint that it's it, an innovative uh, business proposal and certainly being a, a business owner myself, um, I know that, you know, it, it takes a lot to, to put these um, types of business ideas to, uh, to paper and then to get to city council and have to deal with that. But um, my question is around um, so we've alluded to the fact that there's a site plan application process. Heritage Committee has to weigh in on it. Uh, we've, we're looking at a four month, well, I've heard four month, I've heard six month. I've, um, it, is there going to be time for the additional hoops that still have to be basically dumped through in order for this to be um, open and viable for this season, given the fact it's already the 4th of, or sorry, the uh, 18th of April. Through the chair to the councillor, um, I, I can't comment on, on the business plan of, of the applicant, but I can say that uh, the site planning process in this regard, as we've heard from the applicant tonight and the, the business owner, um, this is a temporary structure. There's not much construction that is required. Um, that's not to say that there isn't due diligence required for us to review through the site planning process, but um, I would fully anticipate that, you know, this process could be wrapped up on the city's end fairly quickly. Although, as, as you've heard me say before, it is often driven by, by the speed and the desire of the applicant. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Councillor Schles. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nicole, I, I think you just answered my, my, the one question I had for staff, and that was the, the process that has to be, uh, that's got to unfold for this to take place. And I heard earlier from the, uh, the proponent that he was looking at as soon as possible, definitely in May. 
is that conceivable? I think that you know we're we're a couple of days away from May, um, so I think that that's probably a, maybe a slight wishful thinking. But I, I do think that depending on council's decision tonight on with respect to the lease, that's going to drive how fast the applicant's going to move with respect to the other permissions that are required here. So again, on the planning side, this is a pretty scoped amendment. We would want to circulate to GRCA. We'd want to circulate to Fire. There's a couple of other technical review that we want to ensure. Mitigation is obviously a concern that we've heard here tonight. But I, again. And I think we could work through those that process uh, fairly quickly, depending on how quickly you know we can receive the requirements from the applicant. But but I think you're hearing a desire tonight to move rather quickly from the applicants. Okay, just to be clear, it's only a few days to May, but it, but it's six weeks to the end of May. So we're looking at six weeks, not not a couple of days. So I think I would think there's time, but um, I'll leave it with you. It's unfortunate this has become a divisive thing. It, it, it's a shame because I. From my perspective, I, I, I think it's a good idea. Um, it, it's, it's unfortunate that there, there will be those that think it's not a good idea. And, and, and we deal with that all the time. And, and it's unfortunate. And I think we try to mitigate as best we can to accommodate as best we can. And, and that will certainly happen in this case. And I would mind, remind folks that it's, it's called a year's agreement, but it's really, well, this year it would, would be far less, but uh, a maximum of six months and probably less. Um, Again, weather driven. It's a pilot project is what it is. And I can assure you, if things are not done and unfold as was presented, uh, I would be the first one to say we we're, we're, I would not support renewing it. So uh, it, it's up to the operators and it's up to uh, the folks involved to to make this thing correct, to do the right thing all the way through, uh, to mitigate all the pitfalls have been identified and to address them. Uh, if that's not done, then this is something that I don't think should be renewed. But if they do what they say they're going to do, and it's done in that manner, then I'm supportive of it. And I would I would hope that what I think will happen will happen. There's been concerns tonight to raise that um, it's been portrayed as a place where you go drink beer, watch the game, and everybody gets half drunk. That's not what this is. Uh, but it's been portrayed that way. And again, that's unfortunate uh, because it's not what it is. You're not going to see a lot of drunken sailors at $12 for a glass of wine. I don't think, at least not on my pocketbook. I don't know what the pocketbook looks like out there, but on my pocketbook, that would not happen. To me, it's an ideal and, and a well, a really needed thing on our trail system. We've got a beautiful system, and I think we can make it even better doing projects like this. So I would suggest that if this was in any other city but our own, uh, the folks at Bradford would think it was lovely. But because it's here, we always seem to take uh, a negative view of things, or some do, not everybody does, but we, we never think good of ourselves. And, and, and that bothers me. It's bothered me for a long time. I can remember Buffalo doing a whole program on Talk Proud. And I think we need something like that in this city because we seem to have an inferiority complex and anything that's good, well, it might go wrong. We better not do it. And that's, we don't have a go-to attitude, a let's do things attitude. And I think that has to change if the city is going to go, go forward and progress. So I'm pleased to support it. And as I said earlier, I won't be supporting it if it's not as presented, but I'll wait and see. And it's up to the players to make that happen. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just the staff, uh, th this is located in the Northwest corner of the property, the far back of the lower gardens. Is that the location? I'm reading it in the report. Through the chair, that is correct. And it's a pilot project, so it's from May to October. Through the chair, that is correct. It is a seasonal patio, so it would be weather dependent as well. So if the snow comes a little bit earlier, that will probably shut Grant down a lot earlier than expected. So does it come back to council before before our start up for next year, if that was approved? Through the chair, the direction will be uh, for staff to report back by the end of Q3, I believe it was, or Q4 next year with the results of the pilot program and a recommendation on whether to move forward for next year. Where will the washrooms be? At, through the chair, the, the exact location of the washrooms will be determined through the site plan process. So they will, kept, they will be kept within walking distance, short walk distance from the from the site, like it won't be 
uh, up near the parking lot, the washrooms are the washrooms for people on the trail use or are they for people for the restaurant use? Uh, through the chair, the washrooms are for people who are using um, the restaurant facilities. The, it will be as close as possible to the restaurant and it will be locked outside of the restaurant's operating hours. And we're looking at extending the lease to the lower to the lower bowl of Glen Glenwood Glenhurst Gardens to include special events. Do we know what the special events list will be or what it will say? Uh, through the chair, the current lease arrangement that we have with Glenhurst does not permit them to um, be entering into the some of the uses that they're using right now. So, for example, overflow parking for a taste of Glenhurst, as an example. So we're looking to amend the lease agreement to allow them access to that space to use in the way that they're already using it now. So the specifications and what the special events will constitute will be part of that lease agreement and council will see that before and and approve that or not through the chair the lease agreement typically does not come to council for review we would we can provide conditions on what that means and any special events do have to go through the special event and advisory team process that has circulation across commissions as well well because we'd want to know if for example the special events maybe the special events is that you can hold weddings down there and i don't i know that may not be on the list but we don't know what's on the list or not on the list unless we see it in some way. So would you at least provide us a copy of that special events list in the agreement so we can comment back? Doesn't require a meeting necessarily, but I'd be concerned if we're saying, you know, now you can set up a tent down there, you could perform a wedding. And that would be nice to have a wedding in Glenner's Gardens at the top, but uh, down at the back, that could be weddings have a an evening function to them as well. Through the chair, we can certainly provide that to you in advance of the council's meeting by way of memo. There is no intent to change the use of those lower gardens in any way beyond how they're currently being used and for the purposes of the restaurant. Yeah, and I think Anna had said that it was just to, to legitimize the events that they currently have now and they're already using in the lower part. So as long as that's what it is, that's, that works out fine. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor McCurry, second time. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. And uh, through you to staff. Sarah, um, in the seven days, well, it's ticking down a little tonight, between now and council, is it conceivable that your staff could do a quick scan of uh, other available properties, perhaps more suitable without impacting on neighbours, even though there are only four of them, uh, and provide us with an alternate list uh, that we could consider when we meet as a council? Through the chair to Councillor McCurry, staff in Parks Real Estate and Economic Development have reviewed potential alternative sites. We have reviewed them with the business owner and with Glenhurst, and they are not interested in pursuing alternative sites. Would you be able to provide us with that list since it's already uh, being prepared? Uh, through the chair, we can certainly do that. However, it is not supported by the business owner or Glenhurst, so we would be not be moving forward regardless. Thank you. If, if you could just include that in our package for for a week today, um, so I'm I'm. It's a hard act to follow Councillor Slass when he's on a roll, certainly, and I agree with most of what he said. Uh, I do think this is a, a viable business, despite the fact that we've heard conflicting information about whether or not the users are going to come from the trails or whether they're going to be folks that are going to patronize Glenhurst. Um, I've got to think that uh, the gentleman who's proposing this is no fool. And obviously he knows that he can make a, a going concern of this. Um, I, this is not the first occasion when I have been faced with uh, the question of liquor versus neighbors. And uh, I'd be inconsistent if I did not side on the side of the neighbors, even though there are only four of them, they are the four most important folks, I think, within uh, my my realm of, of decision-making. I would like to see this venture happen somewhere, just not here. I look at um, I look at the corporation of the city of Bradford has insisted upon Glenhurst uh, following the regulations that were set out for us when Cockshits gave us this land way back when. Uh, we do have to amend that lease to make this work on a number of accounts. Uh, and I, I, I really do think that uh, in all good conscience, I can't subject the limited number of neighbors here. There may only be four, but there are four pretty important groups. 
uh, to be listening to this noise. I, I know, I know, I'm just repeating what was said earlier. Uh, and thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so I, I won't be supporting this tonight. I, I asked uh, for alternate locations for a reason, because I think that this would be most appropriate elsewhere. I, I think Councillor Martin may have cited Grants Crossing earlier. Somebody certainly did. Uh, a place which is perhaps more urban and not impacting upon the natural nature of the lower Glen House, Glenhurst uh, environs, which by the way, do need a little more attention from our parks and recreation folks. And I think the idea of, of planting an arboretum there is a pretty darn good one. And we'll follow up on that. Um, so I, I hate to, you know, I, I, this, this, this probably will go in favor of the proponent tonight, but as I said, I support the neighbors above all else. And um, I'm sure that if this does happen there, the, the owners of the uh, business will certainly make every effort to uh, ensure that the neighbors are looked after. Seeing no other questions, I guess we call the vote. Uh, Councilor Van Tilburg. <clears throat> Councilor Van Tilburg. This has been interesting. And I've went back and forth um, listening to the constituents, the proponents, uh, some of my ideas on, uh, at the beginning and what I'd seen on social media. Do I like the idea in concept? Yes, I do. I'm looking at a, some though very shallow plans. There isn't really a lot here. And we don't see what that leasing agreement is. We don't know what that's going to be at the end of the day. And I don't know how to say this, but if I went in with a positive attitude on what I wanted to see, I guess we're all influenced in different ways by presentations. And I guess I wasn't impressed by the presentations. That doesn't mean the be all and end all. It just means that for whatever reason, I didn't get a comfortable vibe and I wish I did. With when I see some plans that are somewhat vacant, drawings with look like crayon and stuff, but there's an idea there. It's probably a good idea. I'm, you know, if you travel to other countries and you're going along a trail, one of these places, they exist. This isn't a new idea. I hope that what I didn't see was a sense of respect to the neighbors, quite frankly. I don't know, I don't know any other way to get it, get there. That's not what I saw when I saw a presentation that said we respect the neighbors. I didn't see it and I didn't feel it. I wanna support this. I, I do understand it's a, a pilot project. I would really like to see the details in a secure end date. Um, but others on council want us to have faith in what we do and it's ideas that take us somewhere and maybe it won't be as bad as what people can anticipate. But I got to tell you, we have to listen to what those concerns are and make sure they're addressed. Because if they're not addressed, we will have to pull the plug. I'd be wondering who would want to invest in such a, um, a container only to determine that three, three months later, uh, it's not going to fly here. And that if that, and that could be because of a lack of business, who knows? Um, I would think that that person would entertain other locations after that, after that fact. Uh, I don't know how the arrangement was agreed. People are asking me how, who, how, who put these people together? Look, I do not know. Uh, the public knows as much as I do. And um, like I said, I went back and forth on this. We'll see how I go with my vote. But I certainly hope there is a lot better communication and respect for the neighbors that said their concerns. My concern is water, running running water, and this, how that's going to work. I would feel more comfortable if there was actual uh, real water and real hydro, quite frankly, but that's not what we're dealing with. That The, the generators, anybody that knows generators, um, I'm a racer, I go to the racetrack all the time. We've got some of the quietest generators going. They're still loud. 
they are. So I have to take person's word that they will be shut down at a certain period of time. I'll have to take the, somebody's word that the music won't be loud. I will have to take, I have to make a lot of leaps of faith to engage in supporting this. And I have to respect the caution that the neighbors are saying to that could be there. The only way we're going to get somewhere is to try though. I'm working through this. I want to be sure when I see what comes, when this comes back to council, I want to make sure that we are on a short term pilot program. If this has a lot of bad vibes, I think I would be with Councillor Sless and being ready to pull the plug. So right now I'm going to lean towards it, lean into this. But I got to tell you, I was not, I was not brought on board with those presentations. Uh, I'm sorry to say. Thank you, Council Van Tilburg. Um, oh, Council Carpenter. Yeah, I asked some questions, but I didn't speak to the item itself. Um, you know, we make decisions all the time that affect neighborhoods and neighbors. Um, I heard a comment that we respect the neighbors. Uh, that would have been nice if we'd have done that with Airedale. We had 8,000 people say, no, don't sell it. And we didn't even discuss with the neighborhood by a petition about what they're doing with the neighborhood. But it got done anyways. 8-3 was the constant vote. Then it turned 8-3 and everything. But just point being is that uh, a good friend of mine who came to town from and came back to town, to take care of his mother, who'd been a been a Brantfordian originally, traveled around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Asia. Um, and Ed said to me, what's wrong with Brantford? They can't be innovative. What's wrong with our parks where we don't have gazebos? We don't have a plan. We have to say, we're going to build a park, but we don't know what it's going to be 50 years from now. So we're not being innovative. And he, and he claims that there's a process to consult with the public a meaningful consultation that talks about innovation and what the long-term use is going to look like and how it's going to impact the neighborhood and, and long-term what it's going to be for the community. That's the kind of innovation that we that we need to do as a city. I'm hoping that uh, staff will hear that and we can start thinking a little differently than we have in the past. And I'm sure we got new staff that are thinking differently looking forward. I know I've talked to some of them. So, uh, Ed was right, you know, we, we, we're missing a lot of things. We don't have gazebos in our parks for seniors. We've got global warming. We've got grandfathers in the parks sitting in the heat where their grandchildren play in the playground, no place for them to be because we haven't been innovative. This is uh, something that some, someone brings to us as innovative. First thing, when I first heard this, I, I said, well, that doesn't make any sense, putting a, putting, a, putting a restaurant at the bottom of Glenhurst where we're supposed to be enjoying the beautiful flowers and uh, down at the bottom there, and we're supposed to be able to access the trails through that process. Um, uh, but the thing that allows me to support this tonight is not that I, that I think we should be, we, is the pilot program. So one, it's a one, so a pilot program means, you know, if this doesn't work out and there's a problems, it won't be coming back. Now we should give the opportunity to see if it works, if it doesn't work. I guess that innovation didn't work for us. But there's a uh, if this was a permanent approval right now, I'd be very I, you wouldn't get my support because I want them or not or locked out. I do have some concerns about the special events. I don't want to see that enlarged. Anna said that's not what it's going to be, so I I I, I take her word for that. I mean, unless there are art projects, those kinds of things, that's fine. Um, but the Lower Glenhurst could be used. I used Lower Glenhurst when I was younger. <laughs> I can't explain. It. What that was about is when I well, when I was dating my young wife, who I'm losing, <laughs> before we were married. Sorry, <laughs> and I won't tell you the story. I've told Rick the story before, though. <laughs> but uh, uh, but I just want to say that you know, as as the residents go, their concerns are valid. They got some very good points to be made, and we'll have to deal with them as part of the the pilot project. The ward councillors are recommending it. And, there's the, and they're the ones that have to answer to their ward constituents about whether this is a good thing for the ward or not. And I always support the ward councillors when they recommend something. Because uh, it's going to be, and if they come back recommending something different because there's a problem, I'll be supporting them there as well. So uh, when we talk about respecting the neighborhood, and I know there's four of you here, four doesn't mean you're, you're not, that you don't matter. Uh, but at one point, council didn't consider 8,000 as a neighborhood. Thank you. 
Councillor Samuel. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I had the opportunity to also attend the neighborhood meeting. Um, and I wanted to just reiterate what Councillor McCurry said, the neighbors in that area are the most important. Um, but I also see the vision that this could be. And so I'm counting on our staff and to the um, good words that were said about Grant tonight, that the things that are needing to be taken care of to make it comfortable for the neighbors in that area um, and to not disturb them are going to be taken care of. And for that reason, I do see the vision for this, for our city and for the beautiful place that it could be. And so I do look forward to supporting it tonight as a pilot project um, and just to see how that goes. And if there are problems, absolutely, it shouldn't continue. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers, we call the vote. Item 7.1.2 carries on a recorded vote of seven to two. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillor Solvin, Sless, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Samuel, Hunt, Caputo. Members opposed, Councillors Martin and McCreary. We're gonna take a three minute break. We'll reconvene at eight o'clock.
right. I will now call upon Maria Visacci and Ian Shelley to come forward to present the customer experience strategy. You will have 10 minutes to speak. Questions will be held at the time of the debate of the item per the procedural bylaw. and customer service. And it's my pleasure to be here tonight to share an exciting way forward for the city's delivery of customer service to the residents of the city of Brantford. Joining me virtually tonight is my colleague, Daniel Kitching, who is the customer service team's business analyst, as well as Ian Shelley, who is the managing partner at Blackline Consulting. Committee members will recall that in 2022, the city was successful in obtaining a provincial audit and accountability grant to conduct an efficiency audit of the city's customer service policies and processes. Last July, we engaged Blackline to create a new customer experience strategy to replace the city's previous customer one strategy that was implemented beginning in 2013. Since then, the city has executed numerous initiatives to improve customer service delivery, including the formation of the Corporate Contact Center Division and the implementation of a Customer Relationship Management CRM knowledge system. Having achieved most of the objectives of the initial strategy, it's, it's clear now that we need to evolve customer service delivery to align with the growing needs and expectations of both present and future Brantford residents. So with that, I'm excited to turn it over to um, our partner, Ian Shelley, to provide a brief overview of the strategy. Thank you, Maria, and good evening, Council. Um, as Maria says, I will keep it brief. I believe your pack would have included our detailed report with a lot of the data. Tonight, I want to try and present you with some, some of the highlights of the findings we have when we looked at customer service, the feedback we received, and ultimately the recommendations we made for the direction going forward. Our next page, please. We started this in a very consultative manner. Um, we met with many of the council members to seek your views on customer service and the views that you'd received from the residents. I met with the senior leadership team. We met with the customer service staff. Uh, we did a thing called process shadowing, job shadowing, where we sit with staff in small groups um, and get them to show us how the work gets done so we can really understand the dynamics that they face in their environment. Uh, we met with customer service from facing staff from across the organization. Uh, we managed to go out with a resident survey, and for this sort of survey, I think we got a fairly strong response from the resident community. Um, with any survey of this nature, obviously, it's the, the people who it's front and center of their concerns that are more interested in responding. And we did manage to get some resident focus groups with various constituencies across, across the across the municipality to get their input in, in small group conversations. And then finally, we, we met with a number of your peers who we know from our prior experience, having worked with, with three or four of these on customer service, that they, they've been grappling with what to do with customer service themselves, and they've made some innovative steps forward. So that gave us you know, more food and evidence of where, where the municipal customer service trends are, are moving at the moment. Next page, please. When it comes to the perspectives on the experience, I do really want to emphasize that we're thinking about what the experience of customer service is, not necessarily you know, the, the, the outcomes, but, but how was I treated? How did the process flow for me? The resident feedback was largely positive. We were 60% 60 satisfied with the experience. Um, when you dig into the 34% the that, that indicated they had some level of dissatisfaction, many of them were indicating it was with the answer they received, the outcome of the matter they brought forward. Um, which is slightly different than the actual process that I had to go through. So, so even though it looks like you know th there's a significant portion, I would say a, a lot of that was really about you know the, the issue and whether I got the answer that I wanted. When we looked at the responses, some of the themes that came through was the quality of the service was deemed to be very high. Staff were, were deemed to be very helpful in the manner of treating residents, and they were knowledgeable about the matters that they were dealing with. Um, the areas that got less positive response, and, and some of these will feature later on, um, was, was the single interaction, the first contact resolution. Can I get to where I need to be quickly and easily, get the answer I want, and get out of the situation again? And that was ranked much less positively. And internally, as we talked to staff, 
Um, they, they indicated some of the structural difficulties of that working within the municipality with the organization that it has and the resources that are available to them to be able to get that you know, once and done experience. I can't present all of the data that we had in the report, but I thought this was an interesting chart that actually was reflected both in the focus groups and in some of the other questions that we asked. The, the residents of Bramford are certainly in that digital dichotomy where there's many people who want a digital experience and there's many people that don't want to lose an in-person experience. Um, and I think the message that came through was that, you know, don't take away what we've got, but enhance some of the digital experience. We actually asked what the preference for interaction was and email ranked at the top as the most preferred method of interaction. But the chart you'll see here was that it had the least level of satisfaction in terms of the experience. So certainly in the consistency of the channels and the experience, the way customer service is delivered internally with some of the operational limitations isn't marrying up de definitively to the desire, but there is no one clear solution. So we need to hit this channel. It's definitely a, going to be a multi-channel environment for many years to come. Next page, please. Going back to some of the symptoms that we heard, there is a customer service department. And when you, we initially came into the organization, it looked as though there was a heavily centralized customer service. But as we peeled it away, there's actually many, many, many points of access that you can get customer service. You can get service from the city, whether that's going to the central customer service, when it's going to arenas or community areas, there's specialized service desks. When we looked on the website, we were able to count over 30 different phone numbers that were listed and over 80 different emails email addresses that can be used to access city services. And they're all promoted almost universally. Uh, and, and certainly some of the feedback we received from staff and from, from residents was the difficulty to find the place that I need to go to quickly. Um, there was some commentary that will resonate with council is that there are residents who would say, I've tried, it was too difficult. So now I just go to my councillor because I know how to get to them and they're my single point now. So that was certainly feedback that we received from some of the residents, certainly something that you, you council reflected at times. Next page, please. Actually, actually sorry, can we, get, can we go back one page? There's one other comment I just want to make on, the, on that previous page. You'll notice the row at the bottom that says CRM used. Um, the CRM used reflects the customer relationship management system where we store the information about our interactions with customers. And um, what you'll see across the bottom is a number of X's and this is indications of where we're getting, if you like, information leakage. And it's very difficult for the organization to have a clear view of everything that's happening with residents. It's very difficult for touch points like the customer service center to know what's happened with requests because we just don't have the information available because we don't have universal systems integration, however we want to think of it. But there's definitely an information gap that's making it difficult to offer the level of service that, that staff desire for residents. Next page. Very quick flow by of some of the issues that we had as we went around talking about customer service, but we came up with three three areas of focus, three three pillars of the strategy going forward. One goes without saying is accessing services easily. How do we make it so that residents get that first touch point and they get what they need and they're not hunting around? Um, excelling at customer service, without a doubt, that's a desire we heard everywhere. Um, what we heard from staff is we need clarity around what we're expected to do. It's not that we don't want to do it, it's that we want to know what it is that we're expected to do. So there's there's a greater level of consistency, comprehension, standardization, all of those sort of things. And then building trust, one of the things that we, we really felt we wanted is that, you know, the residents know where to go and they want to go to that point and they know that that's the entry point and that it works. And the, when when they go there, they get what they need first time and, the, and the, they don't have concerns. Um, a couple of people did comment to us, or a number of people commented that, you know, I, I send emails, but I don't hear anything back. I don't hear a resolution to my my matter. Um, and that erodes trust and it actually probably increases traffic that comes through with people coming back saying, hey, what happened to that? Next page, please. I'll go on one more as well, please. As we think about these pillars, what we tend to think as a consulting organization is, okay, what do I need to change to make to enable that that area of focus, what are the things that I want to do? And so we, underneath each of these three pillars, we've listed a number of initiatives that we feel will progress towards making it easier to access services. We're going to touch on a few of them. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about them. Um, the first one I think is a really interesting one is to sort of rebalance the communication profile and really elevate the customer service center as the place to go. It doesn't mean taking away any of the other access points, but if you look on the website at the moment, 
Um, the customer service center details, when I last looked, were down the bottom of the page. You go to somewhere like a Brampton and the 311s right up in the top right corner. As soon as the page opens, you know exactly where you should be going for customer service. And that's an internal matter as well. It's not just promoting and elevating the profile externally, it's promoting it internally so that people know the role of the customer service center, that think positively about what they can expect from that, that part of the organization. Hand in hand in with that is extending the ability of the customer service center to handle inquiries. And that means onboarding more services. Uh, it means bringing people into the, that organizational structure potentially, but thinking about how it is that when I come in through the customer service center as my single point of entry, as many times as possible, they're able to deal with my inquiry. That's about understanding services, having access to information, it's having access to tools. Um, I want to touch on the on the last point, point five. We did talk about a, a council request process, and it, it, it stays in the same vein as giving council a single point of entry that they know they can go to within the CIA's AO's office um, and, and deliver you know, the, the requests that they have received. One of the advantages we think are around doing that is there's an opportunity to, for you to have structured reporting back on a regular basis. So this is what's happening with all of the matters that we're tracking for you. It's not you having to chase around to find out what information is happening. The internal benefit is having that information captured so we're enhancing you know, the coverage and understanding of what's happening with the residents. So if they do come to a, the customer service center, they have the information available to them as well. Next page. A little bit more information about that of having a dedicated person that's available to you, you know, is the contact that you can go to that's going to um, triage that matter and get it through flowing through the system. Somebody who's available through whichever channel you want to access them, whether it's, you know, a quick email, whether it's a phone call, whether it's in person because you're in the city building, you know that individual and you know how to access them to get you, your matters tracked and reported back to you as they progress. Next page, please. Just to interrupt real quick, we're at the 10 minute mark. Do uh, we have a motion to continue? Two thirds vote. <laughs> Councillor McCreary, seconded by um, Councillor Samwell. All those. Oh. All those in favor? Okay, we can continue. Okay. I, I will. I will keep moving quickly. Um, the, the, the second pillar has got much more of this: the concrete elements that require work internally to resolve some of the structural barriers, which is expanding the information available in the knowledge bases, integrating systems so that those service requests flow backwards and forwards, um, providing training that's the right level of customer service training to fit the expectations of your role. Um, so this is a much more tangible operational piece to enhancing the customer service capabilities. Uh, next page, please. We talked too much about first contact resolution, but having those measures that say this is, these, these measures measure good customer service, measure improving customer service is something we want to see in place that allows the organization to point to the, the, its successes and respond to where it's not meeting it, its standards. And this first contact resolution is a great starting point in my eyes. How many customers got what they needed at the first point of contact? Not the first knowledgeable person they spoke to, which is three contacts later, but that first point of contact. So this is more about building an organization that continues to enhance how it delivers customer service. And it's honest about measuring itself. Next page, please. The real trend that you see around the province, around three around customer services, is three one one concepts. The one number we have that we can ring that's recognizable that gets us serviced. Um, what it really belays is that each channel has a point you go to and you know to go there. And certainly at the moment, Bramford doesn't necessarily have the customer service structure and infrastructure to be able to support that today. We think that these changes put you on a path towards that, and I'll talk on the next page about what that path looks like. A more emerging trend that you're starting to see, and I think uh, Oakville is probably one of the leaders around this, is around a residence portal. Can I enter the server, the city online in the way that I would go to my online banking, for instance, and, and start to perform transactions 
log service request C history. Again, the infrastructure and the integration around systems isn't there today, but we think we've got steps in, in place that allow you to progress that so that in a number of years' time, you'll be looking at the opportunity to implement that, you know, the 311 concept where I know exactly where I can go and that's the place I need to go to. It's easy accessible. And I get everything I need from that point of that contact. Next page, please. The final thing I wanted to flash up is we did build a timeline of these initiatives of, uh, of where we see the city needing to take action to implement some of these changes. There's always a desire to do everything as soon as we possibly can, but there's always resource leveling that we have to do. Uh, this plan is laid out over the next two and a half years. The solid blocks are where we see you know, focused effort from city staff to make a change to how the organization functions. But the one I want to draw your eye to is the the very last one on 15 around the, the 311 and the resident portal where we put the dotted line of investigation. I think the 311 investigations, what's feasible, what's practical, what's possible can start very, very soon in parallel with many of the changes that enable it to be implemented. I really don't want to give the, you know, give the message that we should be waiting on 311. That investigation and planning can start almost immediately so that we can, we can be well placed towards the end of this plan to take advantage of the other changes made to the operations of customer service that allows us then to, to overlay the 311 concept. And with that, I'll pause for questions. Okay, if we can actually go right to the discussion on this item. Councilor Carpenter. So it's on the floor? It's on the floor then. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> item five says council's request process. And I think the suggestion that I had for that was uh, year, years ago, we used to have a number of clerical staff that were attached to councillors. And I discussed this with the CAO already. Uh, and that uh, that worked very well. We would directly go to that contact, who was our contact for that ward, counselor, and we would make our specific request. That way, that clerical person would follow it up, go to the right department, get the answers, uh, whatever that may take, response back to us, and a response back that we could give a proper response back to the existing as well to help us as counselors out. That worked very well, except for I think the problem, as I see it, was that we that clerical person was in the clerk's department, no offense to the clerk's department, but when the clerk's department was short on well, had extra work and didn't get the extra staff they needed, uh, counselor, counselor kind of lost that person that was dedicated to that person. So I think if we're going to have a clerical staff, I recommend that we do this. We have a clerical staff attached to the, the counselor's budgets, it's the 10 counselors, so we could deal with this um, issue of... Uh, responding so uh, right now I, I know I've been around a while I know what individual to email the city staff the city staff are answering hundreds of emails and a lot of time is responding back to counselors emails to get things because we know I know that I would call a certain person it'll get done right away so I call that person right away and it gets done and then the decision goes well that's great we like that because it makes us look fantastic it makes the city look good but a different process would mean that we could, we, that those staff answering all those hundred emails from members of the council, uh, they wouldn't have to do that anymore, that one individual. So just a suggestions for going forward, because the CRM doesn't really work for council lures as it does, uh, you know, and we, and if we're going to go to the CRM and then we jump the queue on everybody else, that doesn't sort of make sense to be fair to everybody else. But so having a clerk responsible to us, it would be my solution for that, for council services just on the customer customer service. Now, when I get calls from constituents, uh, if they're happy with their city of Brantford, they're, they they express how happy they are with the city of Brantford. We should have a way, again, maybe to our clerk to make sure, let that message get through as well. Because, you know, a lot of times staff only hear the negative things, but we hear a lot of positive things about what staff are doing from, from constituents quite regular. And they want us to thank that staff for doing the great job they did when they put in their concern. So a way to get that out as well would be helpful. Thank you. Councillor Sless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What would have to happen to get the phone answered in four rings or, or five rings? Um, I, I constantly get folks that say, you know, it said on the modus I got from the city to, to call this number and they could help me out. I stayed on the line 20 minutes and hung up. Um, that, that's very common that, that I get that complaint. How is it? Is it simply a manpower issue? 
uh, through the chair to Councillor Sless. Uh, yes, um, short answer is yes. Right now, the customer service um, contact center division is staffed with four full-time staff and four part-time staff. And we have not been at full complement since before the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, we lost half of our staff. So we are still rebuilding. Um, one of the deterrents, I would say honestly, is uh, that the four part-time positions are not desirable because they're contract. And it's uh, difficult to keep people in those positions. Um, if they do go into the position, what we're finding is that um, they leave within about four to six months uh, to find another position within the organization that is full time. Um, and then that puts us in a position where we need to recruit again. Um, it takes at least four months to properly train a CSR. So to go through that effort and then have that person leave, um, it's, it's difficult. It makes keeping um, the staff at full complement challenging. Would it be possible for you to uh, give us a memo just what the cost would be, um, Maria, to bring you up uh, to full time complement that, that would be able to do the job, um, you know, the, the way everybody hopes it could be done? Uh, through the chair. Um, absolutely. That was already part of the plan. Um, first, we wanted you to see the, the work, the findings, the recommendations um, that went into the plan. It took about eight months, and this is the most thorough assessment of customer service that we've ever done um, as an organization. So that was the first step. The second step is to look at our resources and um, if council approves of the direction to further centralize customer service delivery, that would involve uh, coming back to council with a restructuring recommendation right. of resources. Even if we took the four part-time and created two full-time out of that or something to get to get it moving. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Councilor McCurry. Chair, sure, thank you. Uh, and through you, uh, welcome, Maria. Thank you for the presentation. When I call um, Microsoft, for instance, the person that answers the phone can look after me. I notice in the report that we're moving towards some of that where frontline people are going to be able to resolve inquiries and questions. Uh, is that, does that require the production of a document that the staff go through sort of step by step? So through the chair, as Ian mentioned in the, the findings of the study, um, right now we, we don't have all of the knowledge of the organization in one central place. So we have onboarded a number of services, but not all of them. Um, for example, if you want information specifically about Wayne Gretzky programming, you do have to call that facility. Um, if you want information about water, we have a separate customer service division that handles utilities. Um, so if, if we centralize them all under one integrated system, then we would have access to all of the knowledge in one place and CSRs would be able to answer those questions in one interaction, um, which as Ian said is is eliminating pain points that customers have. They don't want to be transferred to a voicemail and then, yeah. uh, you know, hope someone gets back to them. Where do I pick up my blue box? Our folks can answer that question when they get it, right? They can, yes. Environmental services yeah. was the first uh, department that onboarded into the central system. Who do I talk to to get a bulk garbage pickup? We can answer that question when they call in. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we do a pretty good job now, and I, I, I think it's a testament to our senior management team, including you, that we're constantly looking to improve ourselves. And I'd be, I'd be doing a disservice to Councillor Utley if I didn't say the three words, lean, six, sigma, which has not been uttered during this iteration of Council. Uh, Councillor Utley, I, I hope you'll watch this on the replay. Thank you. Councillor Hunt. Thank you, and through the... Oh, we lost your audio. You turned your mic off. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> um, so thank you to Maria and Ian for the work done on the report. 
Um, I, for one, am very pleased to see um, the, and I was certainly one that felt that council should have a uh, dedicated um, customer service person because um, we have councillors around the table and, and as Councillor Carpenter said, that have been here for a long time and they know exactly who to contact about an issue, um, which leaves new councillors such as myself at a distinct disadvantage with not having that historical knowledge. So um, I'm very pleased to see that. Um, I, I do feel um, that a lot of organizations place positions like a customer service representative um, as an entry level position. But I think from a business perspective, we really need to treat these positions with the value that they are. And the value that they are is that they are the front facing people, be it on the phone or, or whatever, that are representing the corporation of the city of Brantford when someone decides to reach out. Um, and so for, for that perspective, I, I really do think that um, we need to do something from um, an HR perspective to really elevate the importance of that position for, um, for the corporation and that it not be seen as an entry level position or a part-time position where someone, um, you know, you, as you said, it takes four months to train them and their knowledge and then they, they move on to, to greener pastures. So um, I certainly would be, as a counselor, very supportive of, of elevating the, that role within the, the corporation um, to, to the importance that it really is, because these are the front-facing, first-line people that, um, that our residents and our constituents are reaching out to. And, and they should be well trained and they should be well uh, compensated and they should be proud of the work that they do in terms of representing our, our, our city uh, when a resident decides to pick up the phone or send an email um, and that they are supported uh, with the, the knowledge um, that, you know, that they, that they need to have and are properly trained to be able to deliver that that customer service. So again, thank you both for, uh, for that. Seeing no other, oh, um, and I will Carpenter. say as a business person, um, one of the first things I asked when I came. Yes, uh, just sort of, uh, Maria, if you're looking for where the funds for this can come from, the clerk's budget had a $321,000 surplus. It was in the last week's finance committee meeting. And the council budget itself had a two hundred thousand dollars surplus surplus of council's money unspent in the last four year term. Uh, so if there's an opportunity to find support for council, the money's right there, and it's it that's a half million dollar surplus. So hopefully the finance committee, well, the report's got to come back to council. Council, my council colleagues, you can amend that so that we actually have support for members of council for customer service going forward. We do that this year. Just wanted to highlight that. I, I had to go back and look in the finance committee to get the exact numbers. I hate to be wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hunt, did you want to say something else? I'm just going to jump in and say that as a new councillor, I was actually stunned that there was not some kind of customer relationship management uh, software or program um, that as councillors we could track um, constituent concerns and and whatever, and, and from somebody that comes from an environment where, you know, we, we want to capture um, whether it be good, bad, or otherwise, um, and be able to help people out that the, the lack of a CRM um, for counselors to be able to deal with constituents was actually something I was quite surprised that we did not have as an organization. Seeing no other hands, call the vote. <clears throat> uh, 
Item 7.1.1, cares unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors <laughs> Solvin, Sles, Marn, Carpenter, Van Tilburg, Samuel Hunt, McCreary, and Caputo. We will now uh, consider 7.1.4. Councillor Van Tilburg, you asked to have this separated. Thank you, Acting Mayor. You're doing a fantastic job tonight. Um, yes, I have a question uh, regarding the report. There's a, a mention of having people that stay seven days or longer in the um, parking lots that they buy a monthly pass. How did we come up with seven days and what's the advantage of that? Um, don't we collect more money from people that pay by the day? Uh, good evening, Tom Slowinski, Supervisor of Parking Operations. Uh, through the chair, uh, the seven day uh, rule would apply uh, to situations uh, where a vehicle is appears to be abandoned or, or is left in in the, in uh, the parking lot. The seven day uh, uh, is based on a calculation where essentially it's cheaper to purchase a monthly permit than to stay past the seven days, and essentially that would be that seven day uh, would be used to to. Uh, to start enforcement on an abandoned vehicle that's been left at the at the parking. Uh, so that's the logic. I was just wondering because somebody that might want to stay nine days, do you know what I mean? Like if they're coming and visiting and helping a relative or what have you, um, you know, that's where I was wondering. Monetarily, I thought it was better if people were paying by the day. And I didn't know where that threshold was for the value of the monthly to the seven days so you're saying it's basically at, at seven days you would have been better off buying a monthly pass that's correct so okay that's correct. And, and therefore now how do you determine um it do you leave a notice on the car or something to say hey you've been here seven days you need to have a monthly pass and if there's no response that gives you the ability to act like how does that work yeah through the chair that's exactly what it is it's uh, we would use uh um a note on a on a windshield to notify the individual that um they should either have a a, a pass or typically this the, this uh, uh this initiative is to is, is not to penalize vehicles that are parking there and and using the the facility it's the ones that are abandoned that's really what we're 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 seeing we're finding vehicles that are appear to be unoperable and, and have been there, haven't moved for, for, for long periods of time. So this is really the idea is to, to address that, th those concerns. I thought so, I just wanna make clear and I wanna make sure I'm telling people the facts. So thank you very much, Tom. Elsa Carpenter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Tom, uh, in A on page three, uh, page three, sorry, sorry C, no, A on, on page three says that users with accessible parking permits be exempt from user fees. So is that those that have the parking permit for accessible parking permits that they're, they're in their cars to park anywhere in municipal lots across anywhere in the city? Through the chair, that is correct. The city of Brentford is is uh, one of the very few municipalities, if not the only one, that that offers free parking for uh, for vehicles with a valid accessible pass permit. And that's anywhere in the city? That's correct, yes. Thank you, I, and I, I really appreciate that. I tried to bring in many years ago and I was unsuccessful. Thank you. Not seeing any other, oh, Councillor Hunt. I just wanted to chime in on the accessible parking pass. So um, this was actually an initiative that uh, back probably 10 years ago um, was brought forth by the Accessibility Advisory Committee. At the time I was the chair. Um, and there are actually a number of municipalities that um, allow persons with accessible parking passes to park um, for free in municipal lots. Um, Hamilton and Toronto are two that come to mind. So um, uh, anyway, I just wanted to, to kind of bring that forward. Um, and the rationale behind the city of Brantford, especially downtown, was that uh, in an in a uh, staff report that came to the Accessibility Advisory Committee, it was determined that we had um, we did not have a su sufficient number of accessible parking uh, spots 
uh, downtown and, and people were having to move their vehicles um, from one to the other. And, and that's the reason that uh, we brought that forward. As I said, we're probably going back at least 10 years ago now, but thank you for that. Not seeing any other requests, call the vote. Item 7.1.4 carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillor Sullivan, Celeste Marn, Carpenter, Van Topborg, Samuel Hunt, McCreary, and Caputo. We now move on to resolutions. Uh, Councillor Martin, I believe you have a resolution. Please uh, state it and state your seconder. Thank you. I move seconded by Councillor McCreary, whereas the owner applicant of the property at 379 North Park Street is seeking a refund of a planning application fee minor variance for the redevelopment of the lands to create additional dwelling units. <coughs> Excuse me. And whereas the applicant application for relief from dwelling unit size provisions in zoning bylaw 160-90 was deemed unnecessary as a result of provincial legislation changes under Bill 23 that received royal assent on November 28, 2022. And where city staff have facilitated the applicant's circulation, public circulation and draft report for the Committee of Adjustments prior to the exemption of this application as a result of changes outlined in Bill 23. And whereas the applicant had previously paid the corresponding planning fee to the Corporation of the City of Brantford, is now seeking a refund in the amount of a minor variance submission, $2,585. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City refund 50% of the fee for the one minor variance totaling $129,000. $1,292.50 for the lands at 379 North Park Street. And uh, just speaking to this, we've done this with several other uh, properties in, in the city where uh, the fee was no longer required because of the changes to uh, provincial legislation. So I, I hope I can get uh, councillor support to refund half of this fee as we've done in other, other cases. Thank you. Do we have it? Councilor Carpenter. Yeah, just to stab, when was the, did the owner pay this original fee? Because it could, have, it could have been last year or two years ago. I'm not sure. It the date doesn't say. Good afternoon. Through the chair to the councillor, it was uh, paid with the submission, which was in and around December 14th of 2022. So in this situation, essentially what had happened is, is we got to the end of the line with this process and we're ready to go to a statutory meeting and the province released provincial changes that made this application no longer required. So that's why uh, there's uh, the request here for the fee reduction. Okay, thank you. I'll happily support this. I know that, that they weren't all supported in the past by by. I believe the mover, but I'm happy to support this going forward. Not seeing any other raised hands, call the vote. Item 8.1 carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor as follows. Councillor Sullivan, Caputo, Celeste McCreary, Martin Hunt, Carpenter, Samuel, and Manto Borg. Item 8.2, Councillor Celeste, please move your resolution and state your seconder. I'll speak a little louder. There we are. It's moved by myself, seconded by my word mate, Councillor uh, Caputo. Uh, and I'm just waiting for it to come up on my screen. <laughs> and it's fairly long, my apologies. Whereas Brantford has a long tradition of sport uh, excellence through hosting and servicing hundreds of local, regional, and provincial tournaments and events annually, and whereas the city of Brantford was officially recognized as the tournament capital of Ontario, in the provincial legislature on June 4th, 1998. Therefore, 2023 being the 25th anniversary of this designation. And whereas the City of Brantford's Economic Development, Tourism and Culture Initiatives Department, Tourism Division, has identified sport tourism as a core target market since 2013. And whereas the City of Brantford's Sports Tourism Strategy 2019 aspires to a vision that Brantford will be leading sport tourism destination in structure, supports, and execution as the tournament capital of Ontario. And whereas the Brantford Sports Council is a collaboration 
of sports organizations that work cooperatively to provide collective voice for the ongoing development, education, and promotion of the benefits of sport in our community. And whereas the mission of the Brantford Sports Council to build quality community sport, recreation, physical activity with youth groups, with youth gr sport groups and other cooperative relationships. And whereas the tourism division of the city of Brantford has planned a marketing campaign to highlight the dedication and achievements of the local sports organization delivery of exceptional sports tournaments in Brantford, and whereas the tournament division will be hosting a sport networking event to be delivered on or around June 4th, the anniversary of the tournament capital designation aligned with the sports tourism strategy recommendation to host networking events that bring together sports tourism stakeholders to support the development of ongoing communications and the development of long-term partnerships. And whereas the Brantford Sports Council also approached city staff and elected officials with an offer to recognize the 25th anniversary of the tournament capital of Ontario designation, now therefore be it resolved that an event sponsorship for the Brantford Sports Council in the amount of $10,000 be funded from the Casino Legacy Reserve, along with a sponsorship agreement between the Sports Brantford Sports Council and the Corporation of the City of Brantford to outline the roles and responsibility for each party in a form satisfactory to the Director of Economic Development, Tourism and Cultural Initiatives per the Delegation of Authority bylaw. Basically what this is, um, Mr. Chair, is it's a... Uh, an opportunity, I think, to uh, to showcase and to, to to instill pride and build pride in our sporting community in in the uh, in the city, and the uh, the sports uh, council of Brantford has graciously uh, agreed to host a uh, a large scaled banquet at the uh, Gretzky Golf Course. Uh, so it'll be uh, a city facility that'll be getting the rent that we're we're going to give them a grant to do. So it uh, it's kind of a, a full circle of economy, and uh, I I think it's important. Um, it, it somehow, in, in my opinion, got overlooked. Um, th this designation uh, carries a lot of a lot of weight. Uh, a lot of cities look at it with uh, with envy that, that we are the tournament capital of Ontario, and I think it's important that, that we highlight it and we celebrate it in this community. Um, the, the Gretzky Center for a ten year anniversary got a twenty five thousand um, dollar approval from from this council, and uh, these folks say they can put on a heck of a show for for ten thousand. So uh, I checked with Treasury; they said that. Casino Legacy is the perfect place to take it. There's ample funds there to do it. And uh, I would encourage everybody to support it and be proud of our city. Thank you. Councillor Carpenter. Happy to support this, uh, uh, you know, just sort of message to staff too. I'd like us to support this further than just this going forward. You know, um, 25 years ago, Pat Suchuk had an idea, actually 27 years ago, she had an idea to make Brantford the tournament capital. And uh, I told her to keep that to herself until such time as she had convinced everyone, all the politicians, that this was a good idea before you brought it forward. And she brought it forward and we 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 jumped on board to make it the tournament capital. And it's been recognized as the tournament capital. But uh, I, I'm, I'm I'm sort of afraid to say that as a council and as a city and, and a capital infrastructure, we have not lived up to that. And I'm saying that loud and clear that and I talked to Councillor Sless about this. I'd like this tournament council to actually live up to that infrastructure status for tournament capital and let's find a permanent home for all these individuals that are doing such great work in our community so they don't go wanting looking wanting from place to place to try and find some permanency to run their organizations out of and then spending a lot of their dollars hard-earned dollars for parents trying to get the kids into sports on renting facilities from someplace else when they should have some permanent facilities if we're going to be a tournament capital let's be a tournament capital and just a i just want to just as as a bit of a joke it says uh Whereas the Brantford Sport Council has approached city staff and elected officials, it probably should say some elected officials, but that's okay. Don't worry about that. But I'm wondering if the mover will will uh, agree to a small amendment that simply says, and that staff bring back a financial report on the success of the event. I think we should celebrate that. And it, I hear that that's friendly. So uh, I'm, I'm pleased as long as it's friendly with everybody else. Just like to see the report of these whenever we make donations. And Councilor Slash is right. It's $10,000 for a 25 year celebration. And uh, and twenty five thousand dollars for a ten year celebration. <laughs> Funny how the numbers work, isn't it? <laughs> I'm happy to support the sports council in, in this recognition. And certainly, be willing to take part in the uh, celebration at the Gretzky Center. Or the, or sorry, at the Walter Gretzky facility. Thank you, Councillor McCurry. Uh, Chair, thank you, and, and and let me reiterate the commentary of a number of my peers here tonight, celebrating your excellence in the chair, sir, on a most uh, 
the most interesting evening. Uh, I, I'm pleased to support this as I was pleased to support $25,000 for the celebration of the redo of the famous Wayne Gretzky Sports Center in the beautiful Third Ward. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing this event happen at the Walter Gretzky Center of Excellence in the Second Ward. And, um, you know, it's we often hear some negative commentary in this room and in the community about expenditures of money for dog and pony shows. And, the, you know, the language that we hear sometimes is is rather inflammatory. But I think it's important in this community that we recognize our own achievements. And these are certainly two achievements noteworthy and worth celebrating. The Tournament Capital of Ontario brought to us by, uh, led by a, a dedicated volunteer many years ago, supported by a, a dedicated provincial government and a city council. And uh, Gretzky Centre um, needs no further commentary with respect to its importance to the community. Um, let us celebrate the things that we do well here. Let us celebrate the things that we excel at and make us different from other communities. And as important, uh, there are many in this community who are not blessed with the ability to have so much disposable income to be able to afford events in the community that are not free of charge. And these are a number of ways, along with the air show and other events, where folks in the community have equal access to enjoy themselves and help celebrate our achievements. So. Uh, thank you to Councillor Sless and his seconder for uh, bringing this forward today and their good work on behalf of uh, sport. Seeing no other raised hands, I call the vote. Item 8.2 carries unanimously on a recorded vote of 9 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillor Sullivan, Caputo, Sless, McCreary, Martin, Hunt, Carpenter, Samuel, and Rianto Borg. Item 8.3, Councillor Samuel, please move your resolution and state your seconder, and I hope you have a glass of water. Okay, um, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Caputo, Emergency Shelter Services. Whereas the City of Brantford is the service manager for housing services in the City of Brantford and the County of Brant, whereas the City of Brantford providing provides funding to community agencies for delivery of emergency shelter services. And whereas emergency shelter services are an important connection to connection point for individuals experiencing homelessness, mental health addictions, and other challenges. And whereas it, whereas it is critical that emergency shelter programs support both cl shelter clients and the surrounding neighborhoods. And whereas expanding services available through emergency shelter services, such as peer support, public washrooms, warming centers, cooling centers, and medical supports can increase positive outcomes for both clients and neighborhoods. And whereas city staff are currently developing plans to enhance emergency shelter and homelessness services, now therefore it be resolved that staff be directed to A, conduct a jurisdictional scan of service models that provide enhanced supports to both clients and the neighborhoods in which emergency shelters are located, and B, explore the feasibility of additional services that support clients and neighborhoods, including but not limited to increased medical supports, improved access to public washrooms, uh, peer support, warming centers, cooling centers, and C, provide support, provide a report to Social Services Committee prior to the end of Q2 2023, outlining recommendations regarding additional supports and services to be delivered through the emergency shelter, costs and recommendations, funding source for these additional supports and services, and the process to incorporate these services into future service contracts with emergency shelter providers including accountability measures such as customer service standards and annual service reviews. Can I speak to this? So I'm hoping that tonight um, that I'll receive the support from all of my fellow counselors, as we all know that it's important to take care of those seeking shelter and the surrounding neighborhoods. And so looking at enhancements of our shelter systems, I'm sure is a priority for all of us as counselors. Thank you. Councillor Caputo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I'll reiterate what everyone else is saying. You've done a fantastic job. I am uh, actually very happy to second this and support this uh, on behalf of uh, Councillor Slamall because I think uh, 
the situation that presents ourselves is real. Um, it isn't going to go away. Um, and I, I, I believe that we've all read the, uh, the aging, uh, Council on Aging reports, and our second fastest growing community will probably be this one. So I think we need to really look at opportunities and in, in, in areas that are going to look after people as situations present themselves as mental illness and homelessness isn't a crime but needs assistance. So hopefully we can, uh, this is a start. So very well done. Thank you. Councilor McCurry. Chair, sure, thank you. And I, I'm, I'm happy to support this. I do have a couple of questions and I hope staff can answer them for me. I'm, I'm seeing the phrase jurisdictional scan becoming very common in our lexicon. I wonder if staff could explain that to me without using either the word jurisdictional or the word scan. <laughs> Uh, through the chair, Aaron Wallace, uh, Acting General Manager for Community Services. Uh, we want to see what's working well in other communities and see if we can do it here. So is your plan then to do a head-to-head -head comparison of services in Brantford versus Hamilton, London, Kitchener, et cetera? Yeah, through the chair, that's a part of it. That kind of yeah. apples to apples, shelter beds kind yeah, of thing. Okay. But then also what else is around that? Yes. And is it also your understanding that you're going to be consulting with the people that actually provide us our contractors that provide us the services as well through the chair. Yes, that's correct. And um, it's very optimistic to be done this by the end of the second quarter, which would be help me out here. June. Is that reasonable? Yeah. Through the chair. We'll make that deadline. Okay. Good show. I'm, I'm happy to support this and thank you for the responses. Aaron. I too am happy to support this. I'm actually kind of envious that Councillor Sam will beat me to this, considering this was part of my platform. So, but like I said, I'm happy to support this. Seeing, oh, Councillor Carpenter. I, I too would want to congratulate Councillor Samwell and Councillor Caputo for bringing this forward. Uh, we're hearing these concerns from neighborhoods, and the idea of, of what how we can support clients and neighborhoods is really important part of this process. And I know Ward 5 has a lot of this issue. Ward 4 does as well. I don't think there's a ward in the city that doesn't. But uh, you've, I think you've thought of everything, uh, Councilor Samwell and Councilor Caputo. Thank you very much for bringing this forward. Seeing no other raised hands, we'll call the vote. Item 8.3 carries your name. Oh, carries on a recorded vote of uh, eight to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows Councillors Sullivan, Sless, Carpenter, Van Toborg, Samuel, Hunt, McCreary, Caputo. Members opposed, Councillor Martin. Uh, notice of motions. We have one notice of motion. Can Councillor Hunt please read your title? Your mic's not on. Human Resources Committee Function Review. Thank you. And with that, I'd love to say it that we're adjourned. <laughs>